but I was. Good morning, everyone. I call to order the July meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. I would like to thank everyone who is joining us in the boardroom and via live stream. We have several consequential reports and items before us today, so let's turn right to our business. First, we will begin our meeting with the introduction of a new senior leader. I invite Interim President Ettinger and Senior Vice President Franz to join me at the podium where Senior Vice President Franz will introduce Vice President Robert Stavis. Chair Mayor Ron, members of the board and uh, members of the University of Minnesota community, I'm really pleased today to introduce Alice Robert Stavis as our new Vice President for University Services. Vice President Robert Stavis is a talented and highly regarded leader with extensive experience in real estate, capital projects, facilities management, and complex operation management, which includes managing me. Um, <laughs> she has a strong history of leadership in advancing diversity and inclusion initiatives, and she's demonstrated excellent communication skills. She has a passion for building a high-functioning, inclusive and customer-focused team, and the ability to leverage her legal background in negotiations and in decision-making. In her previous role, Vice President Robert Stavis served as the commissioner of the Department of Administration for the state of Minnesota where she led over two dozen administrative service divisions, including the state's purchasing and real estate fleet, risk management, demographic analysis, and continuous improvement services. Prior to that, Vice President Robert Davis served as the Assistant Commissioner for Property and Procurement at the state, and she led the state's 2.5 billion, with a B, annual enterprise procurement function and established the state's Office of Equity, Equity in Procurement. In addition to her extensive experience, Vice President Robert Stavis holds a JD degree from the College of Law at Florida State University and a BA in communications from the University of Illinois. We are fortunate to have Vice President Robert Stavis join us here at the university and all the talent and experience she brings. This is a very important system-wide leadership position. Please join me in welcoming Alice Roberts Davis to the university and congratulating her on her new role as Vice President for University Services. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Vice President Franz. Mayor Mayron. Regents, good morning. I appreciate the chance to speak briefly today. First, I'd like to say thank you for this tremendous opportunity to serve as the Vice President of University Services at this prestigious institution. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge President Ettinger and Senior Vice President Franz and thank them for the trust and the confidence they have placed in me. I'm excited for all that we will accomplish together. I respect and appreciate the university's reputation for excellence, and likewise, I can assure you that I will hold myself to that same standard of excellence in this role. <clears throat> Today marks one month that I've been here at the university, and if the remarkably warm welcome, the talented team, and the energy of the students, faculty, and staff that I have met are any indication of what's to come, I am incredibly fortunate to be in this place at this time. University services is a unique set of functions that touch every aspect of the university experience. My expectation will be that we offer the best services to students, faculty, staff, and researchers and so that they may focus on the important work that they are here to do each day. As you hear from stakeholders around the state, please share any feedback with me on how we can best serve their needs. I look forward to working with all of you, both individually and collectively, as we build and maintain world-class facilities and services at all of the system campuses. Again, I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Is James coming today? Yes. Yeah, I'm exactly. I think I get those. <laughs> I 
noticed that they... Uh, We were getting used to this. Because it's big position, so I'm sure he had his. They split us up intentionally. It's very good. Look at this. Look at the COVID training and sky stores and things like that. Did she move for a while? No, she went to the state. They're doing a broadband installation. Thank you. I know. It was just getting to the And then I guess 35. It's an accident on university, so I wasn't sure that was good. It was like, just be sitting at the light and it would go past. And it's like, how do I get out of here? My doors. And my like building it. lost power today. Last night, oh, no. like eleven. Like, like, we're gonna proceed on to source it from everywhere. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our first item is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> All those opposed say no. The motion is approved. Next, we will hear the report of the interim president, interim president Ettinger. Thank you so much, Chair Mayron. I'm really grateful to be here today in front of all of you, and I'm truly honored to be serving as the interim president of the University of Minnesota. Uh, similar to Alice, I've only been in the office for a month, but uh, I've already had many onboarding meetings and briefings. Uh, I have appreciation for the individual regents I've had a chance to chat with and board leadership. Uh, the senior leadership team has really been outstanding in, in providing me background information. I've met with other academic leaders, including the Twin City Dean's Council leadership, uh, faculty, staff, and students gov student governance leaders. Uh, we had the chance to meet with Governor Walls and legislative leaders at the very end of the session. I uh, had an opportunity to interact with numerous friends of the university, including many alumni and donors. Uh, I've had the chance to receive advice and, and counsel from three former University of Minnesota presidents, three former regent chairs, and three former Minnesota governors. I don't know what it is about the three, but the, it, it works for me. You're a magnet. <laughs> <laughs> I've also had the chance to attend many events, including, first of all, I wanted to talk about the University of Minnesota Rochester Onward Celebration. It was really a fantastic event celebrating the 10th anniversary of their first graduating class. And uh, Chancellor Lori Carroll did a fantastic job assembling the folks and, and gave great remarks that day. Uh, to me, the most impressive remarks were from the student representative, uh, Evan Doyle, so one of the initial pioneers of the school, who now works as a policy advisor for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS in Geneva, Switzerland. And, and he just, it, just a living example of what a great uh, investment the Rochester campus has turned out to be. I've been at the Alumni Association Annual Social. I went to the Foundation's Arboretum Gala and the Foundation's Summer Celebration. Um, had the chance to give out the awards at the president's outstanding service reception, and those are just really inspirational winners from all over the ranks of the university. I had my first Big Ten Council of Presidents meeting and Greater MSP Board meeting, and I had the chance to represent the university as part of a CHIPS Act panel that was hosted by our own Senator Amy Klobuchar, and she brought Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo into town. And so we really hope that Minnesota will be one of the main areas of investment uh, for that CHIPS Act. And I look forward to representing the university and continuing to meet members of the community in the coming months. I see the system chancellors here today. We have visits scheduled to Crookston, Duluth, and Morris in the upcoming month, and I've already been to Rochester a couple times, and certainly we'll be back there as well. And we're working with the chancellors on, on focusing on getting the most out of each of those visits. We're in the midst of hiring a new executive director of government relations. We posted the position over a week ago, and the posting comes down next Monday. This person will play a pivotal role in our interactions at the state, federal, and local levels. 
Uh, we really view it as a critical position for the university. Uh, the search is proceeding on an expedited timeline because we want them in place well in advance of any potential special session or just even getting ready for the fall hearings related to the budget and, and other things related to the state governance. Uh, this new hire will report directly to the president, but will coordinate and collaborate extensively with our entire university team as we advance and elevate our advocacy. In another area of public outreach, we are going to be rolling out a new marketing campaign in the coming months that I think you're going to appreciate as well. It will remind the public of the many strengths and accomplishments of the University of Minnesota. We are certainly continuing to discuss the future of healthcare in Minnesota, uh, making sure that Minnesota's, Minnesotans have access to a leading academic health system with integrated research, teaching, and top-level clinical care. You will receive an update on this topic at the board retreat later this week. I look forward to continuing our office's partnership with the Minnesota tribes and working with senior advisor Karen Diver, who will be presenting here today uh, with an update on Native American affairs. We are also working on scheduling a meeting with the tribal leaders later this year. I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Athletic Director Mark Coyle for the outstanding success of Golden Gopher student athletes this past year especially in the classroom. I think you'll be impressed by what you hear from Mark here shortly at this meeting as well. There's certainly been a lot of talk and concern about how the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action might affect admission and enrollment at our campuses. There is a working group led by the provost's office that has been preparing for this decision, and we will ensure that our processes are, are compliant with the ruling, but that we also continue to live out our values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. As far as other priorities for this year, uh, we are well guided by the goals outlined in IMPACT 2025, our system-wide strategic plan, and I intend to support the great momentum that we've built through that. I've thought about other priorities for the year, and I've had great conversations with the senior leadership team and many others around the university, and I will be sharing a draft of these with the regents here at our retreat and receiving their guidance on which ones to really hone in on in terms of my time. I look forward to finalizing them at the retreat. I do have a, an announcement on the, this is kind of in the naming category. So what has always been known as the OVPR, the Office of the Vice President of Research, at that school's request, they want, they've asked to change the name to the Research and Innovation Office, and Dr. Shashank Priya will now become the Vice President for research and innovation. It is much more appropriate in terms of what they actually do rather than naming it after, uh, after a person or a title like that. So we definitely support that change and that will be made going forward. In summary, I'd just like to add that I had a sense from a distance how strong the University of Minnesota is and what it means to the state of Minnesota. But boy, after immersing myself in this local community and talking to so many leaders, faculty, students, et cetera, around the state, it, it, my impressions have just been amplified. It's truly a special place. I think we're on the right trajectory and I'm very optimistic for our year ahead. Thank you, Chair Mayor, and this concludes my report. Thank you very much, President Ettinger. Turning to my report, I'd like to begin by underscoring Interim President Ettinger's remarks regarding the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action. The diversity of experience, perspectives, and backgrounds within our student body is a critical component to the world-class educational experience that we offer. The University of Minnesota has been and will continue to be committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the entire system. Now, it may seem to some of you that we have a long break between this meeting and when we reconvene in September. However, the board will be very busy through the rest of the summer working to establish our priorities for the next academic year in partnership with the interim President Ettinger and his administration. Those priorities will serve to inform our board and committee work plans for the coming year. We will also prepare to launch the presidential search in the fall and details on that process will be announced as plans are finalized. That concludes my report. So let us now proceed to the next agenda item. The next agenda item is item five, and that is to receive and file reports. Please note that the three items reported, please note the three items reported in the docket materials. Next, we will consider the consent report. The consent report includes several items as outlined in the docket. Before I call for a vote, would any regent wish to separate an item from the consent report? 
Yes, Regent Turner. Uh, Chair Mayor, and I'd like to um, take out the, um, to discuss for the Huron contract. All right, so we will address that separately. Any other uh, items that any Regent wishes to uh, pull out? All right, uh, then um, let's first address the consent report without yet discussing Huron, um, and then we will move separately on the uh, consent report as it relates to Huron. So with those items excluding Huron, is there a motion to, uh, to approve the consent report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing uh, no questions or comments, all those in favor of the consent report excluding Huron, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. All right, then let's address separately uh, the uh, item as it relates to Huron in the consent report. And I'm hopeful then that uh, uh, Senior Vice President Franz and probably uh, Vice President Horseman, it would be helpful if you all could come up to the horseshoe and talk us through that consent item. Good morning, Madam Chair, Myron Fran, Senior Vice President and Vice President Horseman. We'd like to, at this point, uh, describe the process that we're, we've uh, recommended that the board approve an extension of the current Huron contract. Uh, we have been engaged with Huron uh, since uh, 2021, and we are com nearing the completion of our implementation phase one uh, this summer and this fall, and beginning implementation phase two. Uh, the report that you received points out the information that was um, uh, shows the actual fees paid through June 30, 2023, some uh, services not yet uh, billed, with a total of about $6.7 million as of June 2023. The contract extension is for July 2023 through February 2024 for $2.75 million. That would bring the total uh, expended fees uh, those that have paid in through February 2024 of about $9.47 million. Uh, I'll let uh, uh, Vice President Horseman talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish in this extended uh, contract phase. Yeah, yes, thank you, uh, SVP friends. Uh, Chair Mayron, members of the board. Uh, in June of 22, this board approved uh, an amount of $10 million in the budget approval to uh, address the PEAK initiative. And shortly after that, the University of Minnesota Foundation funded that amount. And um, our understanding was that this amount should be used primarily for contracted services to plan and move the project forward. And that is what has been done. Uh, to this point, um, Huron has been uh, an equal partner in this process and it's been necessary. Uh, we have not necessarily staff this internally. Uh, we are looking to do that going forward and the role of Huron certainly will change over the coming months to be more of an advisor as the university takes the primary lead on the implementation. Right now what we're looking at in phase one um, is in August we will start to have working supervisors meet with their incoming employees that will not necessarily join uh, the central organizations until later in the calendar year, but there is a good deal of onboarding and training that needs to occur. We also will have jobs that are not filled through expression of interest that will need to be posted now, and so that process will continue. Uh, there is also planning for phase two, which includes the College of Liberal Arts and CFANS, as well as the uh, offices under the provost and other central offices. And that project will start to kick off this summer with an initial meeting with CLA and CFANS, the two largest academic units. They are already working internally on how this project would uh, appear in their uh, colleges, what the value would be, uh, where they have questions, and we're looking forward to a productive 
kickoff of that process here yet in, in later July. As we move forward, we are planfully with Huron um, planning a transition to where the university owns a lot of the future planning and implementation of the project. The project after phase two could look different in how we approach it, perhaps by process versus phase. We're learning on that as we go forward. That could be a cleaner, more clearer approach to improvement. And there is some thought after phase two, we will be at a, a mature state where we'll know what these operation centers are capable of and, and what the outcomes are that we're, we're measuring. And we will have agreements in place to meet those objectives with our internal clients. So I'll just stop there and see uh, what questions you may have for us. Let, let me start off with a question just so I'm clear. Uh, and I realize you've covered this, I think, in your remarks generally. But what is it that you envision that Huron is going to be doing then for uh, under this extension contract? Uh, specifically, what services are they going to be providing? What value are, are they adding? And, and I think the corollary is why are, are, can we not do it internally? Do we need to have them in order to, to accomplish uh, those activities? Uh, Chair Mayron, members of the board, uh, you need resources on one side of the fence or the other. Uh, the people internally right now working on peak in human resources and finance and IT in uh, marketing and communications are not additional people we've added for the project. They're myself, my leadership, our managers, our staff, and the same can be said for the other three functional areas and uh, the phase one groups. Um, where the leadership on the transition teams currently are in other functional leadership roles. Huron's role right now, and they have, as I've said before, practitioners in all of the functional areas that have done this work in higher ed settings, have lived through these projects, are partners with us in meeting with transition teams, uh, setting up training objectives, implementing training, uh, working on standard operating procedures for the processes which are changing the processes so we can accomplish this project. And there are a significant number of those that we have had to complete. Once that work is done, their role would likely change to more of an advisor role. You know, as we go into the future, uh, it would probably be much more intermittent and less daily. Uh, right now, uh, this week, they're in person on site at our Don Howe building, uh, and they probably have a consulting team of about a dozen people there. Uh, as I said, many are practitioners in finance and HR. Uh, IT, uh, university relations, and uh, they are working with our team constantly on the project. Okay. Other questions or comments by Regents? Yes, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I want to thank the foundation for their tremendous support of this initiative. And I believe the, um, especially when I look at the business acumen of members there and CEOs and such that they have an understanding that you can go slow and do it yourself. And this, I think we all know, would be a tremendous burden internally and probably really slow. Um, that's just my guess. Um, or we can invest in it and move it along quicker and get quicker results, uh, more efficiencies faster. And although um, I share what I suspect is um, heartburn over the contracts, uh, they are high. I think the choice we've made is to let's get this thing moving along swiftly, efficiently, um, and turn it over to ourselves so we are more self-sufficient in the long run but I think short-term investment uh, and thank the foundation for it. Thank you. Regent Turner. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, Senior Vice President Franz and VP? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, my question comes from, as you know, they're in charge of the PEAK initiative and the most recent information that we received as of July 10th was that as of July 6th, you had had 18 employees that had shown mm -hmm, interest. Mm -hmm. 
out of 43 to 57. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the next step that I see is that you allow 10 more days for people to mm -hmm. apply to those central positions. And then you will go outside. So what happens to those if you don't get present employees that are interested in those those remainder positions and it goes to outside, what does that mean for the people who choose not to do those central positions? This I brought it up before and, and obviously the communication, there's still, I'm hearing so much anxiety about this. Does that mean layoffs? Or how did you like to put it? Um, you don't like to use the word term layoff, but that's in, in the people that I've been hearing concerns from, that's what they're concerned about. Um, and then those positions, when they become central, have you done um, negotiations with the various unions as far as uh, do these remain contract positions, you know, union contract positions, those kind of things. So those are the concerns that I have as far as what happens if you don't get the arrest of the 43 to 57 from present employees, what does that, what happens to the people that don't choose to do it? Okay. Before you answer, uh, let me just say, we're all interested in the, what um, Regent Turner is bringing up, but I wanna remind everyone here around the horseshoe that what we are voting on is whether to extend the contract for Huron and allow them to continue to provide consulting services. So I greatly appreciate what you are raising, Regent Turner. But I want to caution all of us that we, at the end of the day, we have to decide that the issue before us, which is Huron's contract. And so with that, um, if we could hear from you. If I could just do a little follow up. Yep. Sure. Sure. Just, it does pertain in my mind because part of it, and I've alluded to this before, part of their job that I see it is communication. And I don't know if it just hasn't been communicated right or that the, I hear so much anxiety. So as far as I'm concerned, that does fall back in their lap. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Turner, thank you for those questions and concerns. I mean, we have, we realize, we, we have communicated frequently. I think the message has been consistent. I realize that it hasn't reached the, and had the uh, understanding it should have. And that's why in the past we have talked now that we're meeting in person with employees. Um, there is a fair amount of anxiety that's acknowledged. We have explained the roles. We have tried to explain that it's simply an expression of interest, not necessarily saying, yes, I want to go into this role. And so uh, they should take that um, opportunity to understand what their full range of opportunities are. Having said that, if someone doesn't express interest or come, we are working with the local leadership to realign positions, uh, to uh, make full positions. They will change, the duties will change, but we are confident we can do that in many cases. Um, the posting of positions is meant to be internal and we will reevaluate after 10 days if we have internal positions that we haven't you know had the capacity to address yet and we will look at that time frame we will not go external until we know that we have filled these with every internal person that that wants to be there and there could very well during that process be some changing of minds as we we go forward um, the positions will not be uh, realigned to a different job level or job category. These are the positions we need. As we go forward and you know processes change and work changes in the future, that is always a possibility that there could be some adjustments, but these are the main positions we need in these centers and they will remain. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And pardon me, uh, my computer was making noise. So I'm trying to read the docket off my phone um, here. So <laughs> um, I'm doing my best. So to Chair Mayron, to your point, um, to the contract specifically, um, just two questions. Um, one, uh, in general, as we look you know, to the extension of another phase, um, 
what, you know, if any kind of evaluation of Huron services do we do? And maybe this has been mentioned somewhere, but if you could just elaborate a little bit on, you know, how are we evaluating how they're doing and how does that um, fit into um, what's in front of us? And then I'll ask my second question. Uh, Chair Mayor on Regent Farnsworth, I, we have evidence of that throughout. We dialogue with Huron leadership regularly and the change that I alluded to in our past conversations of their, their team that is working with us is the result of that. We felt they were heavy on the consultant and analyst side, but not on the implementation side. So that, that shifted who they brought forward and that has made a difference in our productivity recently as we've come through the spring and into the summer. You know, as we go forward, as frankly, a successful implementation later this year of phase one, a good plan for phase two, and an understanding of how we move forward after that in a very clear manner and align this project on the university lap, not the Huron lap, is the outcome we want. And they are agree in agreement with that. So if we have a problem with phase one or phase two, that would not only point to a problem likely with Huron, but also with the university. I'll just be frank with that. You had a second question, yes. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mariana. Thank you for the answer. Um, the second question is, I guess, around uh, phases and one, if this is kind of the last extension um, that we anticipate with Huron, you know, coming in front of the board, um, just to get an idea of the, you know, looking at the summary of actual and projected fees for peak and what we anticipate coming forward. And then a little bit to what Regent Davenport was talking about, um, the foundation's contribution actually caught my eye last last meeting, meant to ask about it last meeting, but now I guess it's, it's in front of us again. Um, is that kind of usual that the foundation would make a contribution for something like this? And maybe colleagues who participate in the foundation board or others who may have um, may have insight on this could comment. But um, I was just wondering if that is something that's happened um, in the past, because uh, I usually, you know, would envision the foundation um, and all the great work that they do and the many, you know, their existence about contributing back into the university's mission. Um, you know, haven't necessarily seen something like this in the past, and maybe I've just missed it because it hasn't been in front of us tied to something like this. But those would be, I guess, two-part final question. Thank you. Uh, Senior Vice President Franz and then Vice President Horseman. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and Regent Farnsworth. I, Regent Davenport uh, spoke a little bit to this, and, and I would just say that it is a remarkable um, uh, recognition by the foundation of the work we're doing, and uh, we did, had a very robust Vice President Horseman and myself made a presentation to the board about a year ago and had a very robust discussion with, with obviously a very talented group of people on that on the foundation board who have been in business and who've done these kind of projects before and understand the significance of making these investments. Because one of the things uh, I think we came away from with the foundation was a real desire on their part to see the university take head on the challenges of higher education funding. We all know that higher education funding in general is, you know, continues to be in a crisis situation as we all just uh, presented to you and you voted on the budget for this next year. A part of that was based upon the state uh, appropriation that was uh, less than what we had hoped for. And, uh, it's, and, and that situation has continued for many, many years. So I think one of the things we were able to impress the foundation uh, uh, last year was with this sense of the urgency, the need to have better uh, outcomes in terms of performance and delivery of services, career opportunities for employees, making this a really great place to work, but also making sure that we manage our expenditures so that we can go to the legislature, we can go to different places and, and be able to tell them what we're doing to manage our internal uh, uh, expenses, because we have to do that at all times. And, and I appreciate um, Regent Turner, the anxiety that's out there on this project, but that anxiety, in my view, exists no matter what we do, whether we do nothing or whether we go forward with this. The anxiety that we all have about creating, maintaining, and enhancing this workplace for the future is tough. And, you know, we all have those kinds of issues and concerns. <clears throat> I know I do. And so I think that 
the, so that's why the foundation action was so significant, and I think so, uh, and I know that Vice President Horstman and I were very pleased with their, their recommendation to support us in this way. I don't have experience about prior foundation gifts along this area, but I do know that they were very supportive and wanted us to uh, succeed in this effort. Thank you. Before we hear from Vice President Horstman and people who are here when the foundation made that decision, my memory is, and if I'm wrong, one of you please correct me, but I think we, during, as a result of the pandemic and the uh, pressure it was putting on our budget, um, that we went to the foundation or the foundation came to us and they and ultimately asked them to help uh, with um, some of our operational issues. And my memory is that this was the area that they picked as a way of contributing to the well-being of the university. So I think it, it is, my sense is this is probably highly unusual and Executive Director Steves could probably comment on that because he's around the table here, has been here the longest um, on behalf of the board. But I think this came out of the pandemic and, and the foundation looking to find a way to help us on op the operational side, which was not usually what they do. If I'm wrong about remembering this, and pardon? Strategic plan. Yep. Support. Okay. Was strategic plan support. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Vice President Horseman. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Mayron and Regent Farnsworth. And uh, the wait has uh, challenged my short term memory. So if you have a follow up question, <laughs> I can answer. And then hopefully I hit the mark because I think I, I got the gist of it. But please let me know if I'm wrong. I, um, <clears throat> going forward, uh, any agreement we have with Huron should be a lot lighter than this. I can't specify the time frame that we would actually be 100% on our own. I'm confident we will get there. That was part of the outcome of PEAK from the inception was that it would transition out of PEAK into a process, process improvement effort internally that could stand up and carry us forward in more um, specific ways in the future. What it will mean is likely we will have to get uh, very detailed on how we support this going forward internally. And we have a small project office. We're again standing up, but it works directly with leadership that is in place for ongoing reasons. For instance, Monty Vang, who uh, you are familiar with as our Senior Director of Labor and Employee Relations, has a full, more than a full-time job, I would say, and she is managing the workforce transition right now, which includes EOI and in meeting with the unions on that topic. And so um, there are other examples of that across the functional areas and in the units, and we will just have to make a determination of what the level of effort is and have an honest discussion on that going forward. But we are being very um, mindful of the resources we bring to bear internally also. We realize those are costs we have to manage too. All right, uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, so most of my questions have been answered, so I'll just comment on, um, on you know, I, I, as we talk about this phase and the possibility of, um, you know, extending their services on a different scale. Um, and, and Regent Turner, thank you for bringing up the discussion. I think as I was looking at the docket and the memo from earlier, th this conversation, we're having this analysis of, of exactly what services they're providing and understanding the relationship between the office and Huron. I think that's what was missing in there. So just some clarity in terms of, okay, this extension is specifically for this. And we've analyzed doing it internally and concluded that it doesn't make sense for, for X reason. I think that'd be helpful. What I will say, in fairness, you know, it, it, it seems, I mean, it is a lot of money for sure, but it seems because it comes up again, um, it seems, uh, I'm usually good with words, Madam Chair, <laughs> but um, my point is your office could have chosen to sign the whole thing, all phases on the, on the front end, which would have taken away the flexibility, the ability to have the evaluation that Regent Farnsworth was asking about, the ability at each phase to, to assess 
um, how much do we want to bring internally and, and how much do we still need the resources for. So as much as none of us want to be back here, you know, every now and then discussing, are we extending Huron? I do prefer that to when we originally signed it, having have signed a larger, more long-term contract that kind of locks us in. So just want to, I guess, acknowledge and appreciate that flexibility and that mechanism um, and just ask that as we encounter those phases, um, the analysis that I'm sure you're doing that Regent Farns was asking about is kind of shared with us to just kind of understand um, that rationale. But thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Regent Wheeler. Yeah, thank you, Chair Mayron, and thank you very much, uh, Executive Vice President Franz and, and Vice President Horseman. You know, I, I was on the foundation board when you presented to there, and I was on the leadership aspect of the foundation board, and I just wanted to speak to that just briefly and, and chairing the HR committee of that board. And I think a lot of the reasons, and, and just to answer uh, Regents Farnsworth's questions, it was unprecedented uh, for this operational support, but it was thought to be a one-time investment and an investment that would help position us during, yes, difficult economic times, but also positioning our talent in a better way um, because uh, there are people recognized there were duplications of efforts, there was administrative complexity, there was all of these things that this could maybe address and allow people to use their talent for the mission of this university. So I just wanted to make a comment that it was really Really thought to be a good stewardship move, both on the economic challenges that we have and higher education has in general, but also to put the, the talent in the best position that we have and to be able to reinvest in that talent and to reinvest in things like tuition support for, for those being served. So just wanted to say a little bit of that discussion, but it was thought, uh, you know, and really endorsed highly by all uh, as, a, as something to support from the foundation's perspective. And we're grateful now on the other side, grateful for that foundation support because uh, this uh, helps us lead us into a, a brighter future as a university. Thank you. All right. Uh, the last person is Regent Gully. Uh, so many of my questions have already been asked and um, addressed, but I think the thing that gives me pause about this is that is what has been brought up already, that we continue to hear from our unions that this is giving them a lot of anxiety and trepidation and that they don't feel included in this process in a meaningful way. And it does make me uh, wonder about the work of... <clears throat> Uh, how Huron has engaged the unions through the entire process. And it just, um, so I, I guess I just wanna express that for me that feels incredibly important and uh, feels like something that should have been in the process all along and maybe it has been, but we continue to hear that it hasn't been. Um, so there's not really much of a question. A lot of these questions have been asked, but I appreciate you being here and, and talking through this. Uh, yes, Chair Mayron. Yes, Regent, Vice President Horseman. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayron, Regent Gully. I, maybe I can clarify. Um, it, it, if that's a point of confusion, um, the union leadership, and I specifically asked me, can bring that to uh, uh, Ms. Vang, who she has met regularly with them. Uh, Huron is not um, necessarily at the table when we meet with Ask Me, and we haven't thought that's appropriate given they're an external vendor. Um, we certainly can have informational sessions and plan one of those if that would help with clarity. But that has been the intention behind it is that this is a university project and we should own that piece of it. Um, and we do have people individually meeting with employees, as we've said, and that will continue. We're setting up additional meetings as we go forward. But I understand the concern, I really do. Thank you. All right. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, is there a motion to approve the extension of the Huron contract as set forth in the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 Uh, I, I think the motion carries uh, unless uh, we wanna, uh, I think it carries just by my hearing it, but if anybody wants us to do a roll call vote, I'm fine doing that. All right, the motion carries then. Thank you very much.
Now I would like to invite Senior Advisor to the President, Karen Diver, to provide the annual update on Native American Affairs. Senior Advisor Diver, I know you're on uh, Zoom and you're waving to us, and so take it away. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Chairman Run and Board of Regents. I'm glad to be here with you again this year um, to provide you an update on the Native American Affairs Portfolio. Um, I do have a brief PowerPoint to get us started. If you can give me one moment, please. Thank you. Um, so some key accomplishments from the last year. Um, the Native American Promise Tuition Program um, made some inroads. Um, there was some kind of back and forth between student groups, but we did see applications come up and admissions come up. Um, they weren't in huge, huge numbers, but nor did we expect it to be um, with freshmen. Um, we are in conversations though um, with the Office of Undergraduate Education um, regarding what effect on the Promise program um, will be given the state's funding for Native American learners um, tuition and fees. So we'll be having some ongoing discussions about about how we can redeploy that um, funding that was allocated and how we can move it more towards the full cost of tuition, um, the full cost of attendance. Um, and that is one of the items that is outlined in the truth report, which I will get back to later. Um, the American Indian Advisory Boards continue to meet um, with the exception of um, Rochester, which does not have one. Um, but Chancellor Carroll is meeting directly with the Prairie Island Indian community um, and where she has Native American learners. Um, she's reaching out to them directly. Um, there just isn't a critical um, mass of um, students there to make that um, a really fruitful discussion, um, but very engaged the American Indian Advisory Boards. Um, um, President Emeritus Gable met with the chairs and the chancellors um, before she left, and we will be scheduling um, a meeting next year with President Ettinger so he can hear directly from those American Indian volunteers about what's happening at the campus level. Uh, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council um, as you know, delivered the truth report in May. Um, once again, I'll be talking a, a bit about that in a little bit, um, and I'm sure you will all be talking about that um, as time goes on as well. Um, but we are working with President Ettinger to meet with tribal leaders in the fall um, so that we can have that continuity um, as we transition to our leadership. Next slide, please. The Cloquet Forestry Center, um, th those discussions are moving along quite well on multiple fronts. Um, Vice President Myron France um, is work, his team is working with the state of Minnesota doing parcel searches and kind of, you know, outlining the, the realty transactions that might need to occur um, since some of those have uh, state obligations um, with bonds. Um, so there's a bit of research going um, on about that, but the state is actually moving quite expeditiously and continuing to move that along. Um, in terms of internal to the University of Minnesota, um, there's a working group that's been developed between um, Fond du Lac staff um, and the Cloquet Forestry Center staff in terms of what does an ongoing relationship look like? Um, how can we cooperate um, and provide that on-ramp for the Fond du Lac Band and the off-ramp for the Cloquet Forestry Center? Some of these things are really practical in nature of how can we align our forest management practices to be in line with the Fond du Lac Integrated Resource Management Plan so that we're managing for forest health um, and also access for tribal members. Um, we are also going to be convening a group to look at kind of our government relations and our public relations strategy going forward as all these other pieces start to come together. Um, but those conversations are going um, very well and have been very cooperative. One moment, please. Um, for the Mimbres repatriation, um, right now the um, All Council of Pueblos have met and designated the Hopi tribe as the primary um, responsible party for the repatriation of the Mimbres. Um, 
I believe I may have spoken to you previously about this, that this is a really involved process um, that the tribes themselves have to go through as well. Um, they need to find um, some federal land, a site for um, the items and the ancestors to be repatriated to. Um, there's financial considerations, there's tribal capacity um, issues. And as such, the Hopi tribe, it was found, um, would have the best capacity to take leadership in all of this. And, you know, a lot of the questions we get um, fairly continuously is, you know, what is the timeline? What is the timeline? And and that is no longer being driven by the University of Minnesota. Um, the timeline will happen in such a way that is amenable to the tribes um, as some of these decisions are worked out on their end. Um, they will let us know and, and we will take their lead um, at this point. I spoke previously about the indigenous this research guidelines, um, we have had a packed spring semester um, in terms of internal consultation, everything from the deans, the research deans, uh, faculty senate, faculty consultative committees, um, uh, the chancellors, um, and on and on, just looking at the indigenous research guidelines. Um, they have been widely just so well received. Um, I have an immense gratitude to my colleagues within the University of Minnesota systems that they took um, and were so receptive to these indigenous research guidelines as a protocol that um, really does reflect our values and will lead to the best scholarship. Um, we have a couple more consultations that we'll do in the fall, um, and then we'll be in touch with President Ettinger um, around what does it look like, what is the process for um, approval as official policy. Next slide, please. Um, the Native American and Tribal University Relations training, um, the three-part training will be live in the fall. Um, it will be uh, housed on the... Um, Office of Equity and Diversity website. It will be available to all faculty and staff um, and students um, if, if they so choose. Um, three parts, one basic federal Indian law, um, kind of the implications and then some university specific related trainings. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, I just had a moment there. Um, <laughs> it, it, Tad's I was on a roll there and then it just left me. Um, Tad's colleague um, from University of Minnesota Duluth uh, has been helping with that. It is uh, much of the content has been developed as a part of the tribal state relations training um, that Regent Johnson developed um, in his staff and faculty role. And as I understand it, you will all be um, beneficiaries of that as well. And so um, it's just incredibly comprehensive and really gives a baseline of knowledge and that will be available to all of the um, faculty and staff. In addition, um, a small portion of uh, that information will be used to round out the Gopher Equity module that's required of all freshmen in terms of diversity and equity. Um, you may recall um, or be aware that that's a one hour training that actually only ran about 40 minutes. Um, so we will be taking the other 20 minutes and updating that um, along with OED um, and the Office of Undergraduate Education to make sure that um, we are accurately reflecting um, Native American content. We're working to do a lib guide. A lot of what my office does, which is myself and a three quarter time program manager, is just respond to questions for resources, um, definitely around different disciplines or of interest to various colleges. Um, so we are going to um, we are in the process of working with libraries to develop a lib guide based on discipline um, that will be accessible as well to the public. So if you have an interest in um, you know anything from tribal water management to religious practices to health um, outcomes, uh, there will be resources that we can send um, people to on that page that reflects, um, you know, any current books that are out there, but definitely um, the most recent research. Um, and then we are also, um, as a way to kind of consolidate um, where people can come to look for various content. Um, we're working with University Relations to develop a website that will then link to the Circle of Indigenous Nations, the American Indian Learning Resource Center, scholarship pages, 
um, and, and various of the research projects and centers that we have um, that deal with tribal issues. Um, we are making some fantastic progress on uh, faculty hires. Um, this one is actually um, should have been updated. Um, Cheryl Lightfoot will start in the fall in September at the Humphrey School. This is an internationally um, regarded indigenous scholar. Um, Dr. Lightfoot um, works a lot with the UN treaty, UN, UN treaty bodies around indigenous issues and is really an expert in those mechanisms um, in terms of human rights from an international lens. She's been a president of the American Indian Studies Association. Um, she'll be joining faculty as the Russell M. and Elizabeth M. Bennett Chair in Excellence in Public Affairs with a joint appointment in American Indian Studies. And this was quite a, um, a coup, I believe, for the University of Minnesota to get here, um, to get her here. Um, there are two other hires that are being contemplated, one in CFANS with the Healthy Foods, Healthy Lives Institute, um, and an additional faculty member um, with public health. Um, the deans are working with um, the provost in terms of some of the strategic initiative money to help some of these um, hires occur. Um, and along with the other changes being made in the Office of Equity and Diversity, um, Dr. Mercedes, um, Fernandez Ramirez is looking at kind of structurally the capacity of OED. Um, one of those is an associate vice president hire, um, which will allow them to um, at some point um, be able to hire a circle of indigenous nations director, kind of elevate that position um, and make sure we have the capacity within that department. Next slide, please. So the truth report, um, you've all read it, uh, read it, um, I hope. It's fairly extensive, um, 600 pages of extensive. Um, but the important part, I think, for all of us to kind of keep at the front of our mind is really kind of what we're tribes looking for. And when you look at these eight items, um, they're fairly broad categories. There are lots of ways um, actually to, um, you know, implement um, these broad categories when you look um, internal to the university and, and how we look at our operations. And these were developed it, with focus groups um, while they were writing um, the overall truth report um, with tribal leadership, both elected leadership and um, professional leadership in terms of you know, these broad categories, but what might they look like? And um, they had a few ideas. Um, certainly we're already working on some of these. Um, and to our credit, we didn't need a truth report to understand that these were um, really equity issues that should be um, primary when we really made Native American affairs a focus of this institution. Um, like the Cloquet Forestry Center, we are working on it. It is at the top of our list and we are making progress. Um, are there other things that could be done in terms of land back? What about potentially co-management activities of some of our field sites? Um, that's something we could be discussing in, in the future. Um, what do reparations look like? These aren't payments um, to Native Americans or to tribes, but it is how do we look at our resources? Um, you did that with the Native American Promise Tuition Program, um, but are there ways that um, we could actually engage with tribes ar around those priorities in the future um, and how we look at revenue from uh, the Permanent University Fund or Taconite um, shares, things like that, that are made from Indian resources, um, and how do we make sure Native communities are beneficiaries? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Representation, I talked about the faculty hires. Um, there is um, great interest in um, somehow securing the funding for a PhD program um, in American Indian Studies. Um, we take great pride in saying that we were the first in the country um, to have an American Indian Studies program, but yet we lack a PhD program, which puts us behind um, many of the other institutions in terms of adding to the scholarship of the field. Um, and it seems like that would be um, a, a timely investment some of the things are actually more simple, like do we have 
uh, the flags of the tribes represented um, on our campuses? Um, is there signage that we can put up that is reflective of the language, um, the languages that were indigenous to this area, Dakota and Ojibwe? Um, those are a simple way to look at representation. But then also everything from seminars um, to encouraging scholarship on things that um, are important. We have economics classes. Do we ever talk about the role of tribal economies in this state? Collectively, the 11th largest um, employer in the state and largely rural, right? And so how do we increase um, our knowledge internally, both for our learners um, and encourage our faculty to include that content and representation? Um, and then one last example um, is uh, there has been interest in um, endowed funding for an Indigenous Truth and Sovereignty Research Center. Um, there's been a proposal developed. Um, in fact, Regent Johnson um, started working on this uh, at, when he was at a staff level, um, but really kind of a place for um, tribes to go to to seek out Indigenous research and for us to cultivate that next generation of scholars um, who can help with tribal self-determination and governance issues. <clears throat> I talked really fast, um, and so I am actually done now, um, and I'm happy to take your questions or comments. Thank you very much. Uh, what a terrific report, and um, I have to say for myself, holy cow, in terms of all that you have accomplished uh, since you came on in this position, congratulations to you. Um, these were big lifts, and you've been responding to them. And I, I just wanna say, that you probably know where the regents were in a retreat in the next couple days and we're having training by our own expert on the Board of Regents, Regent Johnson, who's gonna be conducting uh, some training for us, basic training on tribal relations that he's provided to thousands and thousands of individuals in, around the state and beyond and we're gonna be, be able to benefit from that as well. So I know I am excited about that and so are my colleagues. And with that, any other comments or questions for Vice President Diver? Yes, uh, Regent. Chairman and <laughs> <Yeah>. Advisor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Regent, or, uh, Regent Diver, Advisor Diver, and uh, uh, Regent Johnson, explain that center a little bit more that you were that she discussed the last the last thing. That sounds really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> you. Do you want to go first? I, de I defer to you, Ted. Okay, thanks. Oh, Regent Johnson, I apologize. <laughs> it, We're all goofed up on the names here. <laughs> I, she used to be my supervisor, so, and <laughs> I was a tribal attorney. She was a tribal leader, so um, we have this <laughs> unusual relationship. Uh, but anyway, um, so the, the Twin Cities campus has a long, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, Region Hipsch, uh, the, 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 the Twin Cities campus has long wanted a sovereignty center, but at the University of Minnesota Duluth, uh, we tr started something called the Tribal Sovereignty Institute. And the main outgrowth of that was um, we have a contract with uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation and the, and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. And we train 100 state employees at a time on tribal state relations. And I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of that today, uh, or the, the, over the retreat. Um, and um, uh, so up till now, we've trained 6,000 uh, people since 2013. We started off with an executive order uh, that there had to be consultations with tribes. Uh, and uh, first, Governor Dayton did one, then Governor Walls did a slightly better one, and then Governor Walls signed into law that there had to be consultation with Indian tribes. And along with that went a, um, that uh, state employees that were working with tribes or who simply wanted to take the training, it's all voluntary, uh, could take the training. So we do it um, mainly on Indian reservations. We were just at Red Lake uh, last month, and we're going to be at um, Shakopee this month. And we, uh, I think we're doing 10 this year th of those trainings. But it's UMD um, and uh, in coordination with two state agencies. So. 
Um, yeah, we'd like to institutionalize that. And it, it already exists at UMD. And um, anyway, and, and uh, I want to call her chair diver, but anyway, uh, senior oh, advisor you're diver. Vice president, so go ahead. Oh, you're vice president. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anyway, we we have both a great affinity for UMD, so uh, you know would like to see that work continue, and also the Twin Cities campus has an interest in the same thing, and also pursuing research and uh, other things. But uh, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, discussion by those around the horseshoe here? Yeah. Uh, thanks. So, um, what is your Johnson? Did you have some uh, a separate I, comment I do, you wanted yeah. to make? All right. I'm sorry. I, I, I saw so, your name. I thought that well, was first your comment. of all. I want to say how lucky we are to have Karen uh, here. Uh, there's, I don't think there's anybody else in the country with these credentials. Um, a former tribal leader uh, went to graduate school at Harvard and then went on to advise President Obama on on policy, but. Um, for the new regions, can you, and I'm going to elaborate on this more, but just a brief, uh, why do, why did we have to return the memories pots and, um, you know, how did we get them in the first place? Karen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to keep going. Um, Could they, were, they, were, they were excavated, um, as a part of archeology span in the early part of the 1900s, um, and I mean, it, it was common practice um, in the field to kind of loot native graves um, for study, both for art purposes and archeological purposes. Um, that was finally made illegal in the 1990s. Um, and any institution that takes public funds has to undergo processes of repatriating those items, um, whether they are um, ancestors or cultural patrimony, um, they have to be returned to the tribes they belong to. Thanks. And then could you elaborate a little more on the uh, Fond du Lac band member and commissioner of higher education and Governor Walls's um, addition uh, with regard to students, Native American students going to uh, state universities or the University of Minnesota that were like a permanent fund set up in the, by the legislature in the last session, correct? Yes, and so um, the current commissioner of higher education is um, Dennis Olson. He is a citizen of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake mm. Superior Chippewa, as am I, um, and a successful part of um, the legislative package this year was really to follow the University of Minnesota's lead and um, replicate the Native American Promise Program, except to expand it to the entire state. Um, it inc includes tuition and fees um, for any Native American learner at either the University of Minnesota um, or the state college system. So um, that is a fantastic investment and will have long-term generational impacts in terms of um, personal self-determination, stability of these communities, building economies, on and on, and um, it's a fantastic leadership and a good opportunity for us um, to say what is the next step to kind of um, make sure those learners think of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing those topics up, Regent Johnson. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senior Advisor. Um, thanks for the presentation, and uh, and also I think for the call we had maybe a couple months ago on this as well. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about <clears throat> the repatriation, for example, there, I understand where we are in the process. I understand that we don't, we're not driving it right now, nor should we. And as I turn to the truth report, um, I guess I'm not sure, uh, to simplify it, what's next or where do we start and who starts that and who owns that and, and, and where does the board fit in? Um, and, it, and again, per our, our previous conversation, and for anyone who's read the report, there's a lot there, and it's not like there's an answer, but it, where do we start? Advisor Diver? Yes, um, Rita Kanyanya, thank you for your thoughtful question. Um, so regarding memories in particular, um, we hosted um, the affected tribes here um, 
at the Wiseman Museum, and they actually gave us wonderful feedback in terms of um, our responsibility, what they would wish for ongoing caretaking um, of their ancestors and the funerary items and cultural patrimony, just in terms of where it should be, um, uh, you know, how to wrap it. You know, they asked that we not stack the pots so heavily um, that they be wrapped in um, a breathable natural fabric, not plastic. And so to them, that was more culturally appropriate for how to carry um, care for those items. And so you know, right now we are um, following their wishes in terms of caring for um, their sacred items. Um, so they are in touch regularly um, with the director of, of the Weissman, um, just in terms of what their next steps are and their decision-making processes. Um, so right now we are just kind of waiting for them um, to take it back. Now, in terms of um, the other items that you referenced in the truth report, um, these are huge institutional items, and I, I really would like to be somewhat clear that um, tribes understand that this is generational institutional work and that sometimes we might make a leap, um, but many more times we'll be making slow and steady progress towards goals. And how do we set those goals and how do we prioritize them? How do we finance them? Um, those are actually really huge processes that you as regents undertake on a regular basis. The first step I'm gonna take along with President Enger is we're gonna make it a topic of for the senior leadership team. This will be the first meeting of the senior leadership team since the truth report was um, released. Um, so we are being as timely as we can um, and we will engage senior leaders about what do those items look like? What are we able to do internally and operationally? Um, as a normal course of business, what are those maybe easy first steps we could take and where will we challenge ourselves to develop some longer term goals and objectives. And of course, the regents will be a part of all of this because some of this is the work of the institution and will take um, either policy or resource changes. Um, and your leadership team, um, along with President Ettinger and myself, um, will be engaging you in the future as we further develop those items. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions for Advisor Diver? All right, seeing, hearing none. Advisor Diver, thank you so much for uh, such a robust report. And this really goes, it made me think of President Ettinger's comments about having been here at the U and, and seeing all that we are doing and how proud we should be uh, of our work and what you're doing in this regard is a perfect example of it. So thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Good all right. Uh, next, I would like to uh, invite Interim President Ettinger and Senior Vice President Franz to discuss the university system-wide safety planning efforts for the upcoming 2023-24 academic year. Interim President Ettinger, would you like to get us started? Yes, thank you very much, Chair Mayron and members of the board. Really, safety is a necessary condition for learning, for outreach, and for service, as well as a personal priority of mine. This summer, we are developing plans to ensure our community feels safe on campus and in the surrounding areas when they return this fall. Our team is analyzing data to help us determine the greatest opportunities to meet these challenges. Our efforts will be multifaceted, build upon previous work, and maximize available resources. We will continue to coordinate with our law enforcement partners to support safety in the neighborhoods surrounding campus. We will continue to pay overtime for more UMPD officers to patrol Dinky Town and the Marcy Holmes neighborhood. We will continue to make staffing a top priority, aggressively working to hire new UMPD officers <laughs> while identifying new ways to increase the number of security officers on campus. Senior Vice President Myron Franz is here and will take the deeper dive into our plans this fall. But before I turn it over to him, I want to recognize the resilience and the commitment of our University of Minnesota Police Department. In my short time here, I've had the opportunity to interact with Chief Clark. His dedication to our safety and that of his Department of Public Safety is very commendable. His team works closely with our law enforcement partners and local leaders and I fully recognize the challenge that public safety presents to us. Please know that we are unwavering in our commitment to the safety of our University of Minnesota students, faculty, staff, and visitors. 
At this time, I would like to turn the program over to Senior Vice President Myron Franz to continue the presentation. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you, Senior Vice President Franz. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, President Ettinger and members of the uh, board. As President Ettinger said, at the University of Minnesota, we continue to put forth our maximum effort in pursuit of the safety of students, faculty, and staff. And I appreciate the opportunity to update you today on our plans for this upcoming academic year. Each year, we welcome approximately 58,000 students to our campuses. There are another 10,000 uh, non-traditional students that we have, but about 58,000 students attend our five campuses. Of that number, about 9,500 of those 58,000 are freshmen, 3,700 are new graduate or professional students. So that's about a total of 13,200 new students out of the 58,000, or almost a quarter of that 58,000 students are new students coming to our campus every year. We're working hard to ensure that they know when they step foot on campus that they should feel a sense of safety and in every sense of the word and know where to go for information. As President Ettinger mentioned, we're developing a robust safety communication and educational material for our students. To, we want them to have the tools and the information they need to stay safe. We take seriously our duty to inform all students, faculty and staff, about safety. And I speak about safety in a really broad sense. University Relations is developing a communications and marketing plan to be sure students know that safety is a priority and they feel supported with the tools that they need to be safe. The plan includes a new website, extending our current safety marketing campaign that includes posters and social media assets, email outreach, and postcards to resident students. We will take every form of communication possible to reach our new students as they come to town. At the Department of Public Safety, the community engagement team is planning a Dinky Town Safety Day during Welcome Week, and Chief Clark and the Department of Safety are working with their partners to ensure a warm and safe welcome to campus. He has several engagement activities that will allow students to get to know our team and learn about the resources that we have at UMPD. Our community engagement team at the Department of Public Safety has a significant presence in new student orientation programs. We want to promote the services of the Department of Public Safety, but we also want to give tips for staying safe on campus, how to contact police, how to report a crime, and how to sign up for alerts. The community engagement team also meets directly with parents and students during orientation to respond to questions and share information. A core component of our safety work is gathering regular feedback from our students and the community. And I want to thank all those people who have contacted us with their concerns and their issues. We recognize that there are many different perspectives and viewpoints, viewpoints regarding public safety, and we must listen to everyone. During the spring semester, the University of Relations administered a survey, and they conducted a focus group to better understand the students' awareness of our safety tools and resources and get some feedback about our efforts to improve safety on campus. The data that the University of Relations received was useful. It helped us understand what we're doing well and what we need to focus on. We learned, for example, that students feel the university does a good job of making them aware of the safety resources, such as 624 walk, where you can get a, a, someone to accompany you uh, on a uh, walk back to your dorm or home, and go for chauffeur. We also learned, though, that students would like improvements in the information they receive during a safety, when a safety incident occurs. And we've had co comments and concerns about people in the community and parents as well. To address this, we have begun reviewing our safe you alert practices. We, are we will analyze all the data that we collect from this research and we will report back and incorporate this into our fall safety plans. We realize that there are different views and we need to make sure we study the best practices in this area. We will launch a safety enhancement in our Twin Cities campus residence halls this fall. You may have heard some of our concerns about this over the last year. I'm pleased to announce today that we will pilot the addition of turnstiles at the entrance of Pioneer Hall. Now these turnstiles help to increase residence hall security through strict access control. Now to support this enhanced security, an additional staff person will be stationed at the entrance to monitor the turnstiles and, 
and additional security cameras will be installed to surveil the turnstile access point as well as other entrances. We have integrated additional instruction by the UMPD into the community advisors in the residence halls, and we have enhanced our communication protocols to keep residents informed about safety. The pilot program will include working closely with staff and students at Pioneer Hall to get their feedback and their experience with the turnstiles to determine whether we should expand this to other areas. This fall, Housing and Residential Life will complete a security assessment of all residence halls in consultation with the Department of Public Safety and Capital Planning and Project Management. Then in January, we will use the results of this survey to help us identify additional safety staffing needs within residence halls. If you will recall, we began installing locks on our residence hall bathrooms last fall, and I'm pleased to report we are scheduled to complete the installation in the last dorm frontier hall next month. This summer, our Department of Public Safety has been consulting with facilities management leadership, deans in our campus, and the Office of Classroom Management about building access. Uh, U-card access, and for those buildings that have U-card access only, that allows access to all students, faculty, and staff. We work really hard to balance keeping our buildings open to promote access, but also to promote the safest security practices that we can have. Buildings that have a clear public access need, like libraries, museums, common space venues, like uh, the Kaufman Hall, our student union, <clears throat> student union are not considering any access adjustments at this time, but we are looking at some of those buildings that remain open. We have about 280 buildings on the Twin Cities campus, for example. About 140 of those buildings are currently open. We are assessing some of those open buildings, uh, but we expect some part of those open buildings now may decide to uh, have their access limited to card, but that's on a building by building approach. It depends on the nature of the building, the use of that building, the particular circumstances surrounding that. So it's a very detailed, very uh, process-oriented uh, um, experience that we go through. We do expect, as I said, for a number of buildings to remain open uh, going forward based upon their access and, and availability to the public. We continue to make progress on the actions outlined in our Impact 2025 strategic plan and safety plan. For example, the third goal of the plan is to develop and implement robust planning and preparedness tools. Over the summer and the fall, the university will host seven emergency preparedness drills. While we hope it never happens, these emergency preparedness drills help us plan for catastrophes like a natural disaster, civil unrest, or active threats. Effective training helps ensure coordination, alignment, and clarity around response roles and responsibilities in the event of an emergency, thereby minimizing harm and saving lives. Emergency training is also a facet of the university's clearly federal requirements. To meet these requirements, the University of Minnesota trains annually through tabletop exercises or full-scale simulation sometimes and tests the multiple components of its emergency operation plan. In addition, the health safety and risk management team have traveled across the state providing CPR training at our campuses and research centers. The team has also enhanced AED defibrillator support through additional training and equipment installation. The tragedy at Michigan State has taught us a lot about certain safety issues, including the importance of training and not just for our public safety and emergency management personnel, but also for students, faculty, and staff. Health, safety, and risk management, along with the Department of Public Safety, have worked to develop training and resources to prepare all students, faculty, and staff for the event of an active threat or medical emergency. Last week, DPS published their active threat training module at, in the university's learning management system. And in September, we will release a series of videos for students, faculty, and staff system-wide on similar top, topics such as shelter in place and evacuations. These videos are intended to provide a brief introduction to key safety topics and safety tips. The videos will prompt the viewer to learn more about detailed information via interactive learning modules. We will promote these trainings and videos throughout the system and through emails and notifications. From the Michigan State tragedy, we also learned the importance of clear and accurate emergency notifications. Health, safety, and risk management 
is producing another video to help students, faculty, and staff understand the types of emergency notifications they may receive, including our safety alerts, sirens, and alarms. The goal of these training videos is to better prepare students, faculty, and staff for safety crises and medical emergencies. During the legislative session, the state allocated the university $1 million in ongoing recurring funds for safety and security, and we appreciate that uh, appropriation. We also received one-time funding of $8 million over the next two years to support public safety work. We appreciate the state's recognition of the need for additional resources. Several years ago, I will add, though, we provided the legislature with our detailed plans and the use of that funding. Because our projects were shovel ready, we have been busy implementing them since May. The one-time funding is being used to replace outdated security cameras and to align building access equipment across all campuses for more efficient building security. Through, through enhanced building security, we can devote our officers' time to policing activities. Our replacement plan is underway. The new state funding helps us accelerate this work. The effort includes improvements in Duluth for cameras and access card readers, the Twin Cities, Crookston, and Morris, and we recently completed a review and process at Rochester for enhancing their uh, safety and access cards. The remaining funding will also support IT infrastructure, because remember, it's, uh, the hardware is one thing, but you have to have the IT infrastructure to manage the cameras, the card readers, and other security technology so that you can actually use the information you're getting. The $1 million per year ongoing fund from the legislature will help with an additional K-9 unit for enhanced explosive detection, as well as additional police officers and security personnel in Duluth, Morris, and the Twin Cities. For additional, we will also need some of the funding for additional vehicles, computers, radios, and supplies as the police and security force expand. On the topic of staffing that President Ettinger mentioned, our police and security personnel, we know that recruiting and hiring is, continues to be a challenge. To address this on the front end and for the long term, we are developing a new police pathway program called Next Gen Badge. This is located at our Crookston campus and tied to their bachelor's degree in criminal justice. This new cer certificate program is targeted towards students interested in law enforcement training and will be offered system-wide. The certificate will include a 21 credit hour pathway program for students interested in exploring options in police officer training. I want to thank Chancellor holtz Claus for all of her hard work and diligence in making sure this program continues to, uh, to move forward. The curriculum is being developed by using information collected through the focus groups with law enforcement, officials statewide, including police chiefs, county sheriffs, tribal police, and the state patrol about the most important competencies needed as we think about peace officers for now and in the future. Our team of subject matter experts are analyzing the data and have begun creating a program that addresses the most pressing concerns in criminal justice, including recruitment strategies to address an anticipated law enforcement workforce deficit in the coming years. Other curricular aspects being evaluated include communication, mental health and personal resilience, and community-based engagement, among a lot of others. We are currently exploring partnership with universities, including Minnesota State, and technology companies to develop augmented or virtual reality scenarios to help and enhance the experiences of the Next Gen Badge Program participants. We expect these courses to begin in spring of 2024. Finally, I will close by discussing how we are addressing the ongoing criminal activity in Dinkytown. As I reported in June on, on our update, we increased overtime for six additional UMPD officers to provide enhanced protection in the Deakey Town Marcy Holmes neighborhood. This will continue through the summer and into the fall. We'll evaluate where we are this fall after the student move in. Over the last month, our officers have worked long days. And as President Ettinger mentioned, uh, we want to support and acknowledge their willingness to work overtime again and again and again. They are doing what they can to protect this vibrant area and serve our students, and I want to thank them for their willingness to do so. But the university is also grateful for partnership with the city of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Police Department, Hennepin County Sheriff, Metro Transit Police, State Patrol, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and other law enforcement partners for their attention to neighborhoods surrounding the Twin Cities campus. 
The Minneapolis Police Department has offered overtime to their officers, of which we are funding some of that, and is providing violence interrupters to work in the area. We are in conversations with Metro Transit about additional coverage at University Light Rail stops and the trains once school is back in session. This presence, along with other tactics like traffic control and parking restrictions, have helped to prevent further harm and destruction in Dickey Town and Marcy Homes. But I must say the university has been and will continue to support safe neighborhoods near our campus, even though they are outside of our jurisdiction. However, we cannot do this work alone. We must rely on our city, state, and regional partners to help address these issues. I want to make it clear that the Dinky Town and Marcy Homes neighborhoods need more law enforcement presence. Again, we appreciate the support of our partners and we will all cooperate together, but this is a big problem that requires solutions beyond the that the university can alone provide. One of the aspects I want to support Chief Clark on is his willingness to reach out and coordinate and collaborate with our partners around the city and even and then the, with the business folks in downtown Minneapolis as well. We'll continue coordinating closely with our city and state leaders, including the Minneapolis City Council, Dickey Town Business Alliance, Representative Knorr and Senator Dietzik. Senator Dietzik, for example, has joined us on safety walks and has been an advocate for improved lighting and other public safety strategies. Representative Knorr has helped us to connect with elders and imams to create community partnerships that promote safety, community, and belonging. Earlier this month, our community engagement team, the Department of Public Safety, partnered with the Minneapolis Park Board. They hosted a community fun night at the Bryan Coyle Community Center. More than 200 people came and enjoyed pizza, basketball, and soccer. This event gave us the opportunity to build relationships, understand public safety concerns in the community, and discuss finance prevention strategies. We plan to host another event on July 22. Building on the success of these safety walks beginning in August, the community engagement team will lead safety walks, safety walks along with students, including sorority and fraternity members, go for athletes, as well as parents, alumni, and members of Marcy Holmes Neighborhood Association. These safety walks have proven to reduce crimes like carjackings and theft from vehicles, and they create a welcoming community and enhanced sense of safety. These safety walks will take place every weekend until Thanksgiving. The Dickey Town Safety Guides continue to be a great resource as they provide safe walks around Dickey Town, offer directions, and interact with those uh, members of the community who are unhoused. We sought and received a grant from the Good Neighbor Fund to expand the services provided by the safety guides to include cleaning of graffiti and vandalism to enhance the vibrance of, the, of that area. To conclude, I will reiterate what President Ettinger said very well at the beginning, that our priority is for the safety and well-being of our students and the entire university community. Our planning for back to school involves proactive coordination and implementation of robust and effective safety measures and protocols. We look forward to continuing our work together to support a safe and welcoming environment that empowers our students to thrive academically, socially, and personally. And please remember, Safety is everyone's job. So let's all work together on safety. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senior Vice President Franz. Uh, as people think about whether they have any questions or comments, um, I'll just make it one comment, and that is I am struck by, um, in your report, how much we are expending in time and effort to respond to crime or uh, perhaps to interrupt it. And uh, my question is, is anyone within the university or, for example, the Minneapolis Police Department focusing on how to prevent crime? Because with, if we didn't have crime, we wouldn't need all this response and, and investment that we're doing to, uh, after the fact to deal with a, uh, a horrible situation. So um, wondering whether the, what efforts, if any, um, we or, or the city are expending to actually prevent crime from happening in the beginning. Well, I mean, I've you. always said you want to you want to address this, take away the guns. I mean, that's my way of preventing crime. But uh, that nobody has an appetite. It seems like state or federal to do that. So that doesn't seem to be an option right now. Well, Madam Chair, that's such an excellent question. And you know, it, 
It really poses one of the challenges that we have. And the challenge that we have is at what level, what level of violence are we willing to live with? And clearly, the level of violence that we experience today is beyond what we were used to and beyond what we expect to experience. And there are a lot of strategies, both with the city of Minneapolis and with some of the local communities uh, that, that I've mentioned, that they do have uh, uh, crime interrupters. And they're, they're trying to get, engage with some, especially some of the youth that have been involved in these activities, trying to find out what are those activities that we can get folks involved in that will give them opportunities. As we all know, so many connections that the youth had during COVID got interrupted. And the community outreach, the community centers uh, have been disrupted. And they and they're really, and then with the civil unrest, they've been really difficult to get some of those community connections back in place. And I think everyone that we work with, I know Chief Clark works closely with uh, Chief O'Hara at the, uh, the Minneapolis Police Department and others in the community. We really see the need for community members to be a part of any uh, reduction in crime activity. It's not simply a matter of, we do need more of a police presence. There, there do need to be consequences for criminal activity. We all know that. And there need to be not only uh, apprehension, but there has, there has to be judicial criminal justice, long-term uh, responses to some of that criminal activity. But there also needs to be some positive things, whether it's you know opportunities for youth to be engaged in athletic ap opportunities or other kinds of opportunities. So it really is, I think, a, it requires a well-rounded sense of community and what's missing in the community that, that these people you know, feel a need to turn to crime. So it's it's a long-term solution, and uh, but there are people working on it, and we work with them as closely as we can. Good, thank you. All right, uh, Regent Turner. Yeah. Chair Mayron and SVB France. Um, as a registered and active registered nurse, um, safety is always, always top priority. And so I want to verbalize my appreciation to both interim president Edinger and you for your, uh, all of you for the commitment, the very comprehensive and full um, program that we have as far as safety. Um, my question is, because I heard a little bit of that potentially our cities could be involved more than what they are? Did, am, did I read you wrong when you're kind of saying that? <laughs> and because uh, I, I would hate to think that they think that we're just like an island unto ourselves here in, in the university area and that we should be handling it all ourselves when in fact we're actually a part of the Minneapolis. You know, we are in the city. So are they doing their part? Is it getting better? And what do we plan to get them to? Um, will do their duty as we're part of the city. Madam Chair, well, that's yes, a, there's a bit of a hot potato. It's a really good question. And I think that, to be fair, I mean, they're in a difficult situation. And they had over 800, almost 900 officers, and they're down around 500 officers. They simply don't have the people to respond as they would like to other parts of the city, not just Dinkytown in our area. They are at a deficit. Generally, they you know with a lot of a lot of large events in downtown Minneapolis, they're they're pressed and they're challenged to do what they need to do for the city of Minneapolis. But I and I will tell you, I actually talked to, to Mayor Fry yesterday. We have conversations and Chief talks to Chief O'Hara all the time, and pre the precinct uh, inspector here. We make it known and we want help. We make it known and we think that there's an event coming up and we need their their help. And you know, we talked to the, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. But with respect to the city of Minneapolis, they need more resources. There's no, they know that. They've been told that. They had, they understand that. So I'm not saying anything new that I haven't said to the mayor and other city council members. And they're trying their best to recruit and rehire and and deploy those resources. Uh, that's why. This is not a short-term turnaround kind of a situation. As much as we would like things to be the way that they were or better, uh, it's going to take some time. And I think things are getting better. Chief O'Hara, uh, the last time I talked to him about a week or so ago, talked about that citywide violent crime is down significantly in a lot of different areas. Um, but, um, but the city of Minneapolis needs to do more. In order for them to do more, they need more resources. So uh, we tell them that. We, we ask for all the help that we can get. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that this group of people that you're all a member of 
worried about campus safety and campus security, and that was sort of it. If you go back and read our 2021 campus report, the campus plan, you will see in that report the beginnings of this. We need to figure out how to be different kind of neighbors going forward. What does that mean? I mean, so we need to think about the, the, how do people access the campus geography, you know, the walkways, the, the lighting, the, the blue, um, the blue, uh, um, what do you call those things? Blue lights. Blue lights. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we need more of those. Um, so, I mean, we now know that physically and, and in terms of community, for example, the 1721 University property that had all the problems last summer, we need to be better mem us, uh, neighbors and with our Greek and, and uh, uh, houses to support to make sure that their neighborhood has responsible neighbors. And one of that was standing up and taking on uh, the 1721 that wasn't working at that time responsibly. So, so it, this this connected. I mean, you know, we have so many wonderful benefits from being in Minneapolis and St. Paul and the Twin Cities. And right now, that comes with this challenge of safety. And both, you know, Minneapolis and, and St. Paul and these Twin Cities. We all have to come together to figure out what are ways that we can enhance communication and opportunities for people so we reduce crime, but how do we respond more effectively? And, and you know, um, uh, I know that um, the county attorney, uh, Mary Moriarty, has been under some criticism about her response to some of these issues. So we have to make sure that the Minneapolis Police Department and the Hennepin County um, uh, County Attorney's Office and, and the juvenile detention offices and, and juvenile courts are all doing it, coordinating to make sure that we're responding to criminal activity, we're diverting it where possible, but we're also making sure that we, that people know that there is going to be a response and a, and a outcome for criminal activity. But it's, it's frustrating. Um, can't say it's going to change overnight. I think it's getting better, but, but that's, that's hard. Thank you. Uh, Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, Senior Vice President Franz, you've spent a lot of time talking about the Twin Cities campus and made a few broad acknowledgments about system-wide initiatives. But going back specifically to the detail you provided around specific actions being taken at the Twin Cities campus around building access, residence hall, bathroom security, um, can, can we revisit that instead in the context of what's being done at our other campuses, Duluth, Morris, Crookston, Rochester, around these kinds of concerns and questions, because each of these campuses is uniquely configured. They have police departments, don't have their own police departments, et cetera, and so who is undertaking that type of analysis um, for each of those campuses? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, yes. and Regent Verhalen. Each campus has a, its own safety plan, and they were in, involved in developing that plan in terms of what are the priorities that they need to address. Is it the dormitory or is it the, the fringe area around the campus? So uh, each of the campuses has developed its own campus plan, and we'll be using that to guide us in terms of how do we allocate these, the $8, the eight million in infrastructure, how do we allocate that $8 million will be based upon those campus plan. But also, there, there will be some increased FTE, for example, in Duluth and Morris, uh, who do have some you know, uh, police presence on their own. So we will make sure that we tailor this for each one of the campuses, because they all are unique and different, than, obviously, than the Twin Cities. All right, uh, Regent Gully, and then Regent Farnsworth, and then we will be taking a short break and then moving on to our presentation by the Alumni Association. Regent Gully. Um, I just want to start, um, Senior VP Franz, and thank you, Chair, um, for, for just thank you for all the work that you're doing around public safety. This is something we hear about a lot from um, families, from students, um, from our community members. Um, and I know that, uh, it, that, you know, for me, and I can't speak for the other regions, but I can say that we've had these conversations quite a lot, that um, we feel the pull of um, both, you know, wanting to keep everything as open as possible for people who are coming onto campus and also um, make sure that our students and our community members are safe, and that's a real struggle. Um, I was, 
uh, I did receive an email from a department that sent out um, a message saying that all university buildings were going to require U card access. Um, and it sounds to me like that is not true at all. Um, but I'm just, I guess my, my question, and it's more of maybe a request, would be that we um, communicate about some of these assessments and, and what's happening on a broader level on campus. Um, because I think, you know, I heard uh, there was a lot of chatter on Twitter yesterday about um, people who were very concerned about us suddenly locking down all the buildings on campus. Madam Chair, yes. and Senior Vice President Goldman, no, thank you for that uh, uh, reminder. No, I, we've tried to answer those because that's simply not true. I mean, at least 70 to 100 buildings out of the 280 will remain open, and it just uh, they're being analyzed on a project per project basis. But we'll try to do a, a more robust job of communicating that so people understand the process. What we really do is we go to each building and figure out who's in that building and what are they using it for, and we let those folks who are there mm -hmm. help decide what that building, does it have a public access access function and needs to remain open or not? And uh, so, but you said it well at the beginning of your remarks, and that is there's this tension because Michigan State sort of tells us to close as many buildings as we can uh, from outsiders. And uh, on the other hand, it's a public university, right? And we want access, we want people there. So the, the main thing is for, for all these buildings, if you have, if you're a student, a staff or faculty, you have your, M card, you can get in under the right hour. So, but we'll we'll continue to uh, communicate that more broadly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Farnsworth, and then we'll take a short break. Thank you, Chair. This will be really quick. Um, I just, you know, want to also um, express deep and comprehensive appreciation to our team, uh, who clearly is committed to working on this complex issue on multiple fronts. Um, I've talked about in the past that I think it's it's extremely valuable when we talk about that here in this setting in our, our safety planning, either short term or long term, depending on what the presentation is about. Um, and also wanted to highlight a little bit uh, to following on to what Regent Turner was asking about with the local angle, uh, obviously our, uh, you know, folks that are living and doing business in um, Dinky Town, Marcy Homes, the surrounding areas of campus, not only just students living there, but um, how those surrounding areas of campus really enhance the university and are a part of the university's fabric, um, while not necessarily you know, geographically considered on campus, um, how those are so important. And um, I saw Tina in the audience, who's our Director of Local Government and Community Relations, and not to put you on the spot, but just wanted to thank you, especially for your work, um, which is, you know, often so deep in interpersonal, relational, um, maybe, you know, just sometimes looks like having a lot of conversations, but really does move us towards the goal, um, particularly what you were talking about, Regent Turner, with the angle with the city of Minneapolis, neighborhood associations, all the different entities that make up that fabric that supports um, the support that we need, but also what role the university plays in um, our surrounding area. And I know Tina's doing a lot of that work along with Senior Vice President Franz, UMPD, others. And so as I was looking at you, I looked right behind you and saw Tina um, and wanted to give her a, a shout out as well because that um, work is often very complicated. Um, involving, you know, volunteer board members on neighborhood associations and council people and people that work at the city and others. Um, and I really do uh, believe and trust that we have a strong, um, you know, strong representation of people from the university doing that work um, in the kind of local government right. space. So I um, just wanted to add my thanks, but also highlight that because, yeah, it's complicated, but um, we have some people who are, have those relationships that are really tuned in um, along with so many others that are working collaboratively on this. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, Senior Vice President Franz, do you want to conclude for us? I would. Thank you. I would like that. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Tina could use a, a, a Medal of Valor to do the local. <laughs> I mean, it's hard work. We talk a lot on the, in this place about state relations and the state legislature and sometimes federal stuff, but the local community context is equally important. And I will be talking about this at the retreat some, about how do we structure our engagement with the different levels of government. And uh, But the, the work that Tina does is truly uh, mind-boggling, and I, I, I agree with your assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much.
you. All right, we will take a 10 minute break. Let's, well, actually, let's come back at 11 on the dot. We've got two presentations left, uh, one by Athletic Director Coyle, but before that, by Lisa Lewis and her group on behalf of the Alumni Association. All right.
about it. Your hat on? I just get too overwhelmed by it. Yeah. With finding it. Oh, well, I write that down again? A little sip of paper someplace. Right. 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 I hear you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you very much. We will resume our meeting. Our ninth item is the annual report from the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, or the UMAA, as we call it, to provide an update on the UMAA's work over the past year and its impact across the university. I'd like to welcome UMAA President and CEO Lisa Lewis, Chair of the UMAA Board of Directors, Pat Duncanson, and UMAA Past Chair Ann Sheldon, who is with us on Zoom. All right, uh, take it away. All right. Chair Mayron, uh, members of the board, and interim president Edinger. Good morning. I'm Lisa Lewis, president and CEO of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. And each year, it's an honor to come here to provide the Board of Regents with an update on the alumni impact on the University of Minnesota's mission. This update will encompass a high-level view of the last five years because we've just completed our five-year strategic plan ending on June 30th, and we'll also take a quick look at the future. You can find all of these materials in much more detail in your docket, and there is printed materials here for anybody who would like to take one. But I'm here today with two proud alumni leaders, Pat Duckinson, the 87th chair of the Alumni Association as of July 1st, and Ann Sheldon on Zoom, who was the 86th chair of the Alumni Association Board of Directors during the last fiscal year. So Ann will start us off this morning. Thank you, Lisa. Chair Marianne, Marianne, members of the board and interim president Ettinger, it's so great to be here today with you. It was a privilege to get to know many of you during my chairmanship and once again would like to thank you for all your continued support for the Alumni Association and its important work of being able to be the bridge between the alumni family and the university. This institution changed my life three times. It taught me the technical and soft skills to be an engineer in a male dominated field in the 80s and 90s and the alumni network to secure a job here in Minnesota. Most don't know this, but I came to the University of Minnesota from a very small town in Northern Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin. And I had a choice to go to Houghton in Michigan, University of Wisconsin, Madison, or the University of Minnesota. And I chose the University of Minnesota because of its partnerships with local businesses and I felt I had a better chance of securing a job when I graduated, and I was right. I spent 35 years working and three jobs. Three of those companies in the Twin Cities, founded in the Twin Cities, had two people who graduated from the University of Minnesota as alumni. My last job was 27 years with Medtronic, and I'm sure you've all heard of Earl Bakken and how he changed our world. But what a privilege it is and has been to work for companies that were growing out of the University of Minnesota. And finally, here I am um, at the end of my career, but not last but least, I'm an ambassador for the University of Minnesota and the Alumni Association. It's given me the gift of paying it forward. So much has been given to me and it's my turn to turn it around and give it back. This is a place I call home and the opportunity to lead my fellow alumni to do the same. For 119 years, every generation of graduates has carried on the mission of the Alumni Association since it was founded by alumni or alumni in 1904. The founding text states our mission as I quote, the promotion of the welfare of the University of Minnesota. And today's Alumni Association is driven to bring the mission to life by empowering alumni to thrive, advocate and celebrate as a community. The Alumni Association, or UMAA for short, is governed by a board of alumni directors. Together, we provide a collective wisdom on how the alumni family can work together as ambassadors for the U and support its strategic projects like the m 2025 plan. It's a privilege to announce here first, as we do every year, the size of that alumni family. Looking across the U of M system, there are a staggering 622,000 living alumni around the world. We have a global impact. And just for context, that's about one and a half times the size of the city of Minneapolis. And 
62% of those people live right here in Minnesota. The UMAA is proud to serve the more than 517,000 alumni from the Twin Cities and Rochester campuses and foster relationships with current students and fellow alumni. Looking at alumni involvement at a high level, more than 80% of the Twin Cities and Rochester alumni have engaged with the university over their lifetimes. Whether that be staying informed, attending events, volunteering, joining, or making a gift, and even more. This surpasses the UMAA's target goal for 2019 to 20, 2023 strategic plan. It would be remiss of me not to mention that this graph shows the numbers since the U of M started reporting this statistic in 2017. It was under the UMAA's leadership that the entire university community engaged in creating a centralized universal mechanism to measure alumni engagement at the U of M. And one way for the alumni to engage with the university is by giving financially. University of, university of Minnesota alumni gave $208 million last year, according to our friends at the University of Minnesota Foundation. And alumni who are more engaged or supporting the university with their talents and time gave over 50% more than those less engaged alumni. Imagine what we could do with further engagement. This two-way relationship with the University of Minnesota is deeply personal, and I'm proud that the Alumni Association continues to collaborate with units like the foundation to build those connections. On behalf of the UMAA, I would like to congratulate the foundation on their continued success. And as the president and CEO of the foundation, Kathy Schmidt, Smithkoffer is a member of the UMAA Board of Directors. With that, I'll turn it back to Lisa. Thank you. Chair Mayron, members of the board, as Ann mentioned, alumni relationships are truly a team effort. The UMAA works with numerous colleagues system-wide, including but not limited to alumni relations officers in each of the schools and colleges, the foundation, university relations, government relations, student affairs, president's office, provost's office, and the board of regents, and so many more. We're also grateful to have hundreds of committed alumni volunteers around the world, like Ann and Pat, and a dedicated UMAA staff of 24 members, who together help make alumni services a reality for the University of Minnesota. Our work is all about walking alongside the alumni at every life stage. These last five years, we've all faced unprecedented challenges, and through it all, the UMAA alumni family and the university community never lost sight of our strategic objectives. And I'm proud to report that the UMAA hit major milestones while adapting to these global tectonic shifts. Today, I'll talk about just three of those milestones and their connection to Impact 2025. That's advocating for the university's legislative agenda, bolstering student success, and encouraging alumni entrepreneurship. Advocating for the university's legislative agenda is part of the DNA of the UMAA. Since its founding, we've been empowering alumni statewide to advocate for and champion the interests of the university. We know that increasing state funding is a performance outcome outlined in Commitment 2 of Impact 2025. To support this goal, through quality, relationship-based dialogue, UMAA's Legislative Advocacy Advocacy Committee, which is called Minnesota 201, brings the full impact of the university's threefold mission to legislators, whether in district coffee shop or at their office at the Capitol. We're especially proud of the work and the adv advocacy goals hit this session in support of Myron Fran, Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations and the entire government relations enterprise this year. It was a critical year and an important moment for the university. <laughs> As always, we stand ready to inform and activate alumni for what's ahead, especially to advance impact healthcare innovation proposal. Our second topic supports commitment one of impact 2025, student success. Alumni are deeply invested in helping students thrive both personally and professionally so that students can take on today's societal challenges. It starts at the beginning with the admissions pipeline. Alumni are strong influencers in a decision to come to the university. And you can just ask these two alumni with me today and their family full of U of M graduates. 
And then alumni are here to help students throughout their college years. They want to open doors for jobs and become mentors to those who want and need guidance as students and young professionals. To make these alumni to student connections easy, virtual, and global, the UMAA has an online career platform called the Maroon and Gold Network. This platform is essentially an online Rolodex for the entire U of M alumni, family, and students. As these graphs show, students have been signing up in droves over the last five years, as have alumni. Today, the online community is more than 16,500 strong between the alumni and the students, and that spans over 70 countries and has graduates from all five campuses. The Maroon and Gold Network is a free, centralized tool for the university community that fits within other career services provided by the university, academic advisors, professors, and the career offices in each of the schools and colleges and across the system. It's where the alumni network comes to life in the 21st century and is open to all students and alumni. The service is built to provide students with warm leads rather than cold calls. So how is that possible, you might be thinking. So we'll take a look at College of Liberal Arts and Gopher football alum Brock Vereen's profile. So a student will search from the thousands of alumni volunteers who are listed in the network. And they might find Brock based on industry, job title, or any other keyword search. Now all the ha student has to do is reach out, which to us might seem simple, but to them could be quite intimidating. So then how do you get past that? We've made it easier through a messaging feature that is distinct from other online networking and social media sites. It uses machine learning and takes the information from Brock's profile and guides the student step by step on how to make that professional outreach to Brock based on the students and Brock's shared topics and interests. The functionality on the Maroon and Gold Network is very focused on removing barriers to help students, such as first generation students, overcome those unwritten rules of growing your professional network. Building students' social capital and networks in their field of study is priority one for the Maroon and Gold Network. An alignment with the values stated in Impact 2025 Commitment for Community and Belonging. So what starts as messages on Maroon and Gold Networks blooms into real life connections and impact. From the alumni perspective, Brock says the connections he's made with students have been both fulfilling and rewarding. It's an easy way for him to give back, like Ann said, and pay it forward to the next generation. From a student lens, Cheyenne Rizzoli is on his way to build his network for upcoming graduation. The Maroon and Gold Network has been, a, has been vital for students, and we particularly saw this during COVID when online networking was their primary way to reach out. For CFANS alum, Roberta Ryan, the Maroon and Gold Network has been a recruiting tool to bring a talented students for short-term, real-world experiences with her employer, the Wildlife Science Center. We call them projects, but they're basically micro-internships, and Roberta, a biologist, is able to bring future marketers and communicators to help the Wildlife Science Center succeed. All Roberta had to do was post a job description on the Maroon and Gold Network's job board. And for students, these micro-internships gave them the entry-level and foot-in-the-door experience they need to jumpstart their careers. The UMAA added this functionality at the request of both students and the career professionals across the U of M system who said there was a want and a need for more short-term opportunities. And according to our platform vendor that powers the Maroon and Gold Network, the University of Minnesota is an industry leader in providing micro-internships for students. Our final highlight from the last five years is the Minnesota alumni market. It's aligned with the values of entrepreneurship with Impact 2025's commitment to. It's also aligned with the Alumni Association's need to be entrepreneurial itself as we create our own funding and then reinvest that money back in the Minnesota alumni market and the UMAA. Over the last five years, the market has grown exponentially. So early startup, we had 14 alumni-owned businesses. Today, the market supports more than 165 with representation from four of the five campuses. The UMAA is the first to offer a store for alumni businesses to sell products. And as of last year, 
We're empowering alumni entrepreneurs of all kinds to list their businesses in an online alumni directory. The directory is a one-stop shop for anyone who values a U of M degree and wants to buy a product or service from a U of M alum. Now, we don't endorse these organizations, but rather it's a platform to connect to alumni products and services and showcases the depth of the many entrepreneurs in the U of M alumni family. So the directory includes all of the alumni who sell products on the Minnesota alumni market, like Carlson alum Jessica Chung. She's a top row, first from the left. And last year, she hosted an event and taught calligraphy um, in partnership at the alumni-owned brewery Urban Growler. The directory also includes service-based companies, from lawyers to medical professionals, consultants like Phyllis Braxton of Pink Consulting. She's a College of Education and Human Development alum, and her picture, she's pictured in the second row, first from left. The directory also includes iconic brands, and you may not know that they are owned by a U of M alum, but now you will. <laughs> One of those companies is O'Shaughnessy Distilling, and I won't ask you if you've been there yet, but uh, <laughs> which, we've co uh, which was co-founded co -founded by Kelly O'Shaughnessy, College of Liberal Arts alum. Kelly and her husband are on the bottom row, third from left. The Minnesota alumni market is truly a treasure trove for any person who is looking to support small businesses and advance the careers of our alumni entrepreneurs. Of course, there are many more highlights that I'd love to share from our past five years, but in the interest of time, we'll leave it there, focusing on how we advocate, how we support students, and how we support alumni entrepreneurs. But I do invite you to check out the full report in your docket materials. Right next to that report is the UMAA's new strategic plan. This plan was shaped by input from members of this board, university leaders, student leaders, alumni volunteers, and thousands of alumni who participated in a university-wide stakeholder survey that was created in collaboration with our partners at the foundation and in university relations. It has five priorities of which are aligned with multiple Impact 2025 commitments. These priorities are, are the blueprint, or what we would like to say the maroon print, on how to seize opportunities in front of the alumni family and the university. As the association embarks on this new plan, it is poised to build on its history while forging a path that is more nimble, inclusive, responsive, and focused by 2028, leading into our 125th anniversary. But before, do we, before we get to 125 years, we'll hit the 120 mark in this fiscal year under the leadership of Pat Duncanson, our 87th board chair. So, Pat will bring our presentation to a close by talking about the year ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Chair Mayron, members of the board, Interim President Ettinger. As Lisa said, January will be our Alumni Association's 120th anniversary, and we plan to celebrate. It's a major milestone. I invite each of you to attend our longest standing alumni gathering, the annual celebration this April, coming up April 26th, where we will commemorate this history and history yet to be written by alumni of this university. Like Anne, I am privileged and honored to be chair of one of the oldest parts of this university, the Alumni Association. Like Anne, Chair Mehran and co-vice chair Hipsch have been fantastic past chairs of the UMAA, and I know that the three of you will be tough acts to follow, but I'm determined to do my best. Regents, like all of you, I love this university, and if there is a way that I can pay it forward to today's students, Count me in, I'm interested. The University of Minnesota has changed the life of my sister, my brothers, two sons, my wife, and of course, my life too. One day, it, will, it may change the life of my youngest grandson who was born this past April, but I guess we'll have 18 or so years to see how that plays out. <laughs> For my time as a student, I will admit that I didn't necessarily learn all the nuts and bolts of becoming a production farmer while being on campus uh, here in the Twin Cities. Uh, but it did taught me how to think and how to analyze new things as they came along. As an alum, the U has kept my world a lot bigger. And it's been vital to the success of my family farm in southern Minnesota. In fact, that lifelong learning continues, and I was fortunate in the last two days to attend a, a meeting on the St. Paul campus and be able to be in the outdoor laboratory uh, next to the St. Paul campus, which I'm inspired again. It, it happens again and again. I think the greatest lesson this place taught me was to stay active as a curious citizen, to be involved, 
to give back, and just like all of you are as elected leaders who serve the people of this great state. As chair of the UMAA, there are a few things I'm focused on as we jumpstart with our new strategic plan. First of all, the presidential transition. This is, a, this is a historic time. Like all stakeholders who are interested in the university, alumni are eager to get to know interim president Ettinger. I know you've hit the ground running, and on, and on that note, thanks again for attending our UMAA year-end social last month at the Weissman Art Museum. It was an honor to have you and to meet you there. Thank you. As it has been with previous transitions, the UMAA will keep alumni informed as the search begins for the 18th president and to make sure they're engaged and sharing their thoughts on the Board of Regents website. Second, continuing to build on the momentum of the UMAA's advocacy for the university in St. Paul and around the state. Alumni stories are very powerful, and we will do our part to amplify, activate, and engage alumni to show just how easy it is to advocate for their alma mater. Third, continuing to find ways to grow and reinvest the UMAA's financial resources. To be able to fulfill our mission, we must fund our mission, and the UMAA continues to be entrepreneurial in its funding approach. Over the past five years, the monetary value of the alumni relations services provided by the UMAA to the University of Minnesota was more than $16 million, an average of 3.3 million per year. While we are more reliant on our own entrepreneurial initiatives than other associations, our impact on alumni and students is quite substantial, and I believe greater than that of other associations. We are proud of our work to activate and engage alumni from every corner of the globe to help them thrive and to serve the university. But we know there is more alumni potential to tap, to increase the range of their involvement, and to pay it forward for the university. A strong alumni family that is engaged even more than they are today means far greater opportunity for students and the entire institution. These past five years through what seems like everything and, at us, and yet the UMAA made remarkable progress, surpassed goals, and is in a better position to promote the welfare of this university and impact the lives of alumni and students alike. The UMAA is and will continue to be a nimble organization that is powered by an alumni family who cares deeply about the association and the alumni that it serves. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. And Lisa and I are happy to answer questions and to hear your feedback. Thank you very much. Any further presentation or can we open it up for discussion and reaction? That's it. All right. I was trying to figure out um, myself what a uh, number president or chair I was. <laughs> if you're 87th, what did that make me, like 30th or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But I haven't been able to find it on the website yet, so. <laughs> we will follow up on that. Yeah, I know it's yeah. so. All right, okay, any comments or questions? Yes, Regent Davenport. Uh, I love the micro internships, yeah. and I have to give out my annual shout out to the marketplace, <laughs> which I usually wear someplace or another, um, but I think that's just, uh, genius. So yeah, thank you. It's really good. Really good. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you very much to all the presenters. Um, one thing I wanted to focus on, and I guess this is my theme for today, is uh, and. Lisa, we've talked about this before, that the University of Minnesota Alumni Association focuses on the Twin Cities and Rochester campuses, but graduates from any of our campuses could become a member and be a part of the Maroon and Gold Network and, and those types of activities. And I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about that as well. While we have, you know, as a, as a bulldog with Regent Kenyanya as well, um, we have obviously our own campus alumni association, but or alumni affiliation, but there are opportunities for other campus graduates to participate in the alumni association. Um, Chair Mayron and uh, 
Regent Van Halen, thank you for that question. And it's we, we see it as additive, like an and rather than an or, that there is clearly a connection between the alum and their campus. And that, that shapes their experience and how they connect kind of through loyalty and, and emotionally. But at the same time, there's also services that are available that aren't campus specific. If you want to listen to an interesting faculty member, if you want to shop on the market, if you want to be, if you want to mentor a student, it doesn't matter what, what campus that student attends. So there are pieces that are, I think, more global and system wide in, in its lens. And then there are pieces that are campus specific. And I do think there is an opportunity to navigate that a bit more and actually I'm having some of those conversations um, where it's how do we, with resources we have or with growing resources, how do we make this something where alumni get some central services that are non-campus specific and then the campuses continue to do the great work that they're already doing um, so that we best serve alumni. But there's a single M on everybody's degree and we recognize that. Any follow-up? No, I, I appreciate that, President Lewis, and apologies for casually calling you Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, the additive piece, I think, is really important because graduated from Duluth but moved here to the Twin Cities and wanted to find others that I could collaborate with and talk with and interact with, both around the Bulldog tie, which I do through the campus, and then through the maroon and gold family, which all of our campuses are a part of. So thank you for that. Quick question for you. I know that the Alumni Association has been in dialogue with uh, OBR for quite some time about aligning the or adopting the University of Minnesota uh, Block M. I'm looking at the materials here uh, that you're putting up in front of us and I see it's still not there. So what's the timeline on addressing that issue and bringing that home? It's, it's clearly important to all of us here. Well, I think, uh, Chair Mayron, if I could, Lisa and I'll tag team on this answer, and Anne, please uh, join in as well. And I keep looking to my left because in this room, Anne is up on the <laughs> screen to, to my left. left. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it may appear awkward to others not in this room. Um, but first of all, the uh, the the board of directors has has a, a, a approved moving forward with the idea of adopting the Block M. So we are very much wanting to move forward with that. But before we can, there are some details and I'll say obstacles that we're still trying to work through. And I'll let Lisa and Ann address those. I would just say the, right, the, the scope broadened. So if it was simply just changed to the M, then I think that would be done by now. Um, but the scope broadened and has raised some other issues that the board's looking at. And I think that we'll have to navigate carefully to make sure that it meets the interests of the university and the alumni association together. So those other issues are tied in with this. And so um, we need to sit down and just talk those through. Our board had a really uh, robust, I think healthy conversation um, at the June meeting to discuss that. So it's high on the radar and um, this year is is it's in my goal list. It's been in my goal list, but it's, it's still there. Can you this give year. us a sense of what the other issues are beyond just changing the block M? And, and the reason I'm asking this, I, well, I've been on the board four years and I raised this back in 2019 and here we are four years later and it still hasn't, we haven't brought it home yet. So can you give us a sense of what's, what's out there besides the block M itself yep. in your materials? <laughs> We have navigated through every issue but one. Um, so that's positive. And there were, there were a number, there, was, there were six, and now there's one. So each, you know, we, we keep getting better and better. The last issue is around um, mm -hmm. alumni who um, are in the healthcare industry and how they um, can connect to the university. The university is looking very carefully at its healthcare and the system and what's happening and making sure that what it has going forward, that we're all marching forward together. And we absolutely understand and support that concept. The question is, are alumni who work, who are graduates who work in the healthcare industry, um, are they competitors to the university? And are, do they have full access to alumni services and alumni participation in the same way? So that's what we're trying to navigate through is um, making sure that alumni who are in the healthcare industry are able to 
participate in the alumni directory and do the other things that all alumni can do. Um, and so navigating that and what that means when we use the M, does that then create competition in terms of promotion in the magazine and in other areas? So those are, that's what we're navigating through to make sure that we're balancing both interests. And that's not easy, but I think, well, I, I, there are several paths forward. I think there's, there's a solution there that we can find. Okay. Uh, any other comment by past chair, uh, President uh, Sheldon on this? I, Lisa mentioned uh, yeah. she was going to call on you, so I, I thought I'd give yeah. you that opportunity. I would, to I would just reiterate exactly what Pat and Lisa said. The board is all on is is ready to move toward the M, but moving to using the university's brand means that we need to operate within their guidelines. And so Lisa's team has had to will will need to change how they do business, and they have adapted to that, and they have a plan to move forward. Um, and to Lisa's point. There has been, um, it does feel like the scope has broadened, but that's been okay. Cause again, we're using, we're not using our own brand anymore. We're using the university's brand and we need to protect that. Um, and as she mentioned, this last um, item that we're uh, wrestling to the ground is around healthcare. And um, our job as the alumni association is to represent all alumni, regardless of where they work. But we also wanna honor the fact that the university has needs to make sure that they're not endorsing um, a competitor. So I'll just leave it there. Okay, uh, fair enough. Well, if there's anything that myself or a uh, former uh, chair, Hip, shall volunteer him, can assist in this to, to uh, getting this to fruition, happy to, happy to help. All right, uh, Regent Hip. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Maron, and I love this presentation every year, obviously. Uh, Lisa, you're a great leader, Pat, and uh, Ann, you've done a great job steering the organization and setting goals. What really comes out to me is the 622,000 alumni living worldwide, and 62% of those that live in Minnesota. But what that number doesn't share is, of those 38% that don't live in Minnesota, how many work for Minnesota companies elsewhere in the world and make Minnesota stronger in that way? I have children that do that. And um, they got their degree from here, work for Minnesota companies, and they live elsewhere, but they're making Minnesota stronger in that way as a world player. So, uh, you know, is there any sense to how many companies these alumni have started throughout the world in Minnesota? Uh, that's my question, I guess. Um, Chair Mayron, uh, Co-Vice Chair Hipsch, uh, we, we would love to have that data. The, the hardest thing to find on alumni is employment data. The foundation does a great job trying to collect it. Um, so no, we don't know um, exactly. So it's, it's very kind of one at a time in some ways. They do use technology and, and other things to mine that data, but alumni change jobs too. Yeah. So tracking that is, is a little bit more challenging. Well, they just leave it. Thank you for all you guys do. So appreciate it. Thank you. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And on that specific point, uh, Co-Vice Chair Hipsch, in terms of the entrepreneurship, our newly named Office of Research and Innovation, you know, might be able to partner because I imagine they're tracking some of the innovation that our alumni are doing. Um, uh, Chair Sheldon, Duncanson, uh, President Lewis, appreciate the, the, the presentation. Um, before I get to my serious question to the two chairs, what went wrong in the gavel exchange? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. wow. We were all thinking it. <laughs> Crystal gavel. So that is under further investigation. Okay, all right, all right. Can't comment on a pending investigation. I understand. Sorry, I'm not allowed to comment. Okay, yeah. thank you. But, but um, great question. <laughs> Thanks for the report. Thanks for the work and, and the, the, the outcomes speak for themselves. You know, in, in looking at the maroon and gold network and I, um, you know, haven't, I, I look forward to, you know, playing around in there and, and contributing and whatnot. But uh, Regent Verhalen was, was bringing up, you know, how affinity, sometimes at the university level, sometimes at the campus level. But I think sometimes it's even lower than that. It could be the unit, could be the sports team you played for, it could be band and whatnot. Do, do alumni's, alumni and students have the ability to, to explore by that? You know, I mean, I think most alums 
are certainly willing to, to help a student and, and, and feel that affinity as a University of Minnesota graduate. But if, if this is a band student and you're Jason Langworthy, I mean, come on, you know, um, <laughs> because people's affinity um, kind of drills down. Do, does, does, the, does the network allow for that? Yeah. Uh, Regent Mehron yes. and uh, co-vice chair uh, Kenyanya, the answer is yes. Um, that's part of the beauty of this is the alumni can you, can, you can download your LinkedIn profile and make it easy, or you can start from scratch, but you can put in anything you want. This is who I am. This is what I did at the U. This is what I'm willing to talk to you about. This is when I'm willing to talk to you about, and this is how I want to be contacted. You have a, the alumni have a lot of control over how they frame who they are in that system. The students can go in and do a keyword search on anything. So if you say, I was in this fraternity, Student can say, I'm moving to Boston. So is there anybody who is in Boston, who studied this, who is in the fraternity? Um, that's why we want thousands and thousands and thousands of alumni, because the, the bigger the group, then the more likely that you're gonna find that connection. So the answer is yes, you can do a global keyword search. You can put in multiple things and then see who pops up based on what's in their profile. Brief follow-up, Madam yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I guess my next question is, how is the adoption and usage of this, and, and how can the university encourage that? I, mean, I know we I we have is a gold pass. Is that is that the other system um, that that runs concurrently? And obviously they're a little different, but it seems like we want students using both. So um, yeah, if you can comment to adoption and, and how we can support that from the university side. Sure, it's been a, a deep collaboration between the UMAA, particularly with career services, like when we started. Before we even went into this, it's does this exist, is there a need? Yeah. And the answer was no, it doesn't exist, and yes, there is a need. And there were actually a couple, Carlson had one, there were actually a couple of small, um, kind of decentralized, and what's happened over the last five years is it's all come together in one. And so it's one contract, it's efficient, and it's better for the students and the alumni. Um, so we work very closely with advisors and with career services so they know about it. So if a student is sitting in their office and saying, I don't know what to do, I don't know what I want to do, you know, they can say, let's see if we can find an alum who's doing what you're thinking about. Yeah. And you can have a conversation with them. And so we're pushing that as much as possible. And um, people are using it. So awesome. thank you. All right, uh, last, uh, Regent, John, Regent Ruth Johnson. Ruth Johnson. Yes. Thank you, Chair Mayron and leaders, Lewis, Duncanson, and Sheldon. Well, as a healthcare professional, I, I just wanna ask a couple of questions to clarify with the alumni. So I assume, obviously, everyone who, say, graduates from medical school or nursing school or whatever is <coughs> part of the alumni, can be part of the alumni. How, what about people who, tr who train here in medical fields, like there's come as a resident or fellow in internal medicine or surgery or pediatrics or something, are those uh, trainees of the university able to, are they considered alumni, do you know, or is that just a totally different? Um, do you, yeah, Regent Mayron and- uh, They may spend several years here on the campus and work at university hospitals, but it's not quite the same as being, you know, a college or graduate school. Uh, graduate. Uh, Vice President Tolar brought, brought that up um, several years ago, and so we expanded how we look at it and we think about alumni as credentialed versus degreed mm -hmm. um, because there are certificates and because there are other ways that you come here. But if you go, if you are accepted and you go through a process, you know, whatever the, the program is, and you complete it, then we consider you an alum. Okay. And so um, thanks to Dr. Tolar, we did expand that because he said they really create relationships that are here and that we should right. honor. So right. we, we many, did that. It's several years of training for many people and, yeah. sure. and, and of being very loyal uh, to the institution and so on. And then fi thank you. And then just finally to clarify, so is the, this issue that so people have trained here either in medical school or some other field or, and now they're out having their own practice somewhere else? And is that, is that what is of concern about potential conflict of interest with the university's medical co health complex here? I don't quite, uh, quite understand. You're, you're, you don't want to endorse somebody who's an alum. 
Regent, Regent Johnson, Johnson, if I can, and Chair Mayron, um, I'll, I'll try to explain it in my words, maybe slightly different than what Lisa said. It's, and, and Anne alluded to it very, very well in that it is a, it is a branding issue. Mm -hmm. And by adopting the, the university's Block M, we no longer have our own separate brand. And so we have, we as an alumni association have a big responsibility to make sure we help protect the university's brand that we will be adopting and using. Mm -hmm. So as part of that process, the university, rightly so, is very concerned about making sure that we follow certain protocols and certain restrictions. And one of the friction areas is how do we handle, in particular, medical school or medical issues. And so we have to be careful we don't endorse another medical practice and in direct competition with the university's interests. So we're kind of caught in the middle because we have interests supporting those alumni, whether they work for the university or a private practice in any corner of the state, whether it be in Ada or Zambroda. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure we support interests not only within the state, but around the world. So it's really a branding and marketing issue and protecting the university's brand and making sure that we don't do something that is directly competitive with the university's interests. Okay, and does that include things like having other alum, you know, on other alumni using Block M or other symbols and if they're not at, at, in a practice directly at the university or is that not an issue? It's just, it's just more or less, okay, this person, this people have a group of surgical practice over here but they're not at the university. So you just wanna make sure they're not claiming any university. Well, one, one example, if I might add, would be um, within the university, within the Alumni Association's magazine and if, yep. a, mm -hmm. if a private medical practice wanted to uh, let's just say, uh, offer uh, advertising to the Alumni Association. Um, what are going to be what are going to be the restrictions and the ties that are associated with that? And yet they might be in direct competition with services that are provided by the university. Um, sure. Okay. Thank, well, thank you. I just appreciate a little further yeah. clarification. Just trying to understand. All right. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate the presentation, but mostly really appreciate all you do. And I figured out I was the 57th oh, chair. Okay. <laughs> so 30 years ago yeah. <laughs> behind you. Man. Check that one off my list for the day. Yeah, exactly. You're done. I couldn't figure out when uh, Regent Hips was because he came much later. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Our uh, uh, next item is... Uh, I, I invite the Director of Intercollegiate Athletics, Mark Coyle, and Associate Athletic Director and Chief Financial Officer, Tim McCleary, to share the annual report on Intercollegiate Athletics for the Twin Cities campus. Director Coyle, take it away. Okay, good morning, uh, Chair Mayron and uh, President Edinger and members of the Board of Regents. Uh, once again, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to uh, present the uh, wonderful things going on in Gulf Athletics. Um, I apologize for not being in person. I'm actually in Las Vegas at NCAA Men's Basketball Committee meetings this week, and uh, I appreciate your understanding as I do this virtually, and we have Tim uh, in the boardroom with all of you. I, I can tell you as I begin my eighth year as the athletics director here in Minnesota, uh, I have never seen so many changes uh, occurring uh, across the country in college athletics, um, and uh, this is a very unique and interesting time, and I hope you all know how much we appreciate your support and alignment and we want to do everything we can to represent this institution, uh, the state, in a first-class manner and all that we do. Uh, next slide, Tim. Um, to talk about some of the changes, as you can see, um, Tony Battiti was named uh, the new commissioner of the Big Ten on April 12, 2023, uh, and started on May of 2023. Uh, commissioner Battiti uh, comes to us from uh, Major League Baseball, where he uh, – was a deputy commissioner. He has a strong, strong background in media intelligence agreements. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, Julie Manning and myself and our staff have had a, a chance to meet with him and spend time with him. And it's been, uh, it's been a joy to work with him. Uh, the Big Ten, uh, as all of you know, has started a new seven-year media rights deal with Fox, CBS, and NBC. And again, that partnership began uh, on July 1st, uh, just uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, I can tell you I had a chance to have dinner last night with um, – uh, the head of CBS Advertising, and they're thrilled to have the Big Ten uh, as part of their package. And, and I know the Big Ten is excited with these, uh, these new TV partners. 
Um, the Big Ten Conference uh, will admit UCLA and USC as official members on August 2nd of 2024. And it's important to note that the most recent schools to join the Big Ten were both Maryland and Rutgers uh, who were admitted to the conference in 2014. So again, you can see the map, but a year from now, we will uh, fully integrate USC and UCLA into the Big Ten. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to recap each year, um, you know, our, our department. And as all of you know, we sponsor 22 varsity sports. We have more than 625 student athletes. We have 260 full-time employees. Uh, and if you go back to the day when I was hired, I talked about the importance of doing things the right way academically, athletically, and socially. And again, if you look at what's going on across the country in college athletics today, I want all of you to clearly understand that we take our social responsibility very seriously. Uh, we have worked and engaged a company called Protection for All, which focuses on um, behavioral risk management issues. Uh, we make sure our student athletes, our coaches, our staff understand who our faculty athletic reps are and their role between athletics and the campus environment. Uh, our staff is very aware of the anonymous U report system and all those 625 student athletes and employees have my cell number but again, we want to make sure that we do things the right way all the time. Our FY24 budget is $135 million. That budget ranks in the bottom half of the Big Ten. According to an outside study uh, conducted by ESI, athletics generates um, approximately $471 million annually in economic impact in Minnesota. Uh, 1.2 million people each year visit Gopher Athletic Facilities. And since 2021, more than 40 million TV viewers have watched Gopher Athletic events on TV. So we obviously understand we're a very visible part of this institution. We embrace that visibility. And again, we want to make sure we represent it in a first-class manner in everything that we do. I also want to point out that this past year, we partnered with the Carlson School of Management to provide meaningful and successful project opportunities for students and athletics through the Leadership Lab. Uh, in addition, you may have saw this past spring that PJ Coach Fleck I had a chance to uh, help uh, teach a class in the Carlson School of Management. So we are very grateful for our partnership with Carlson School of Management and continue to develop leaders uh, both in and outside of our FX program. Next slide, please. When we talk about our focus on our students, uh, of course, academics is a very important part of that. And our goal is to do things the right way with respect to our academic achievements for our student athletes. And I want to recognize JT Bruitt and our Lindell academic staff uh, they do a phenomenal job. Uh, Provost Corson, uh, Vice um, President uh, Bob McMaster, we work closely with them. But we're very, very proud of what our student athletes are doing academically. Uh, we have a cumulative grade point average of 3.4 through the spring semester, uh, which makes us one of the highest public schools in the country. Our graduation rate is 94%. And you can see that we've had, uh, we have recorded our five highest GSR statistics in school history during the last five years. The Gophers posted a school record 96% graduation rate last year, 94% in both 2020 and 2019, and 93% in 2018. 14 of our programs earned a perfect APR score in the most recent reporting, and seven programs had a perfect 1,000 multi-year rate. We've had 318 academic All-Big Ten nominees and 115 Big Ten Distinguished Scholars. We've had nine academic All-Americans in a school record 56 academic all district selections. We led the Big Ten and tied for seventh nationally in academic all Americans in sports that we sponsor. We ranked eighth in the nation and second in the Big Ten in academic all districts and sports that we sponsor. And Minnesota has had 70 academic all Americans since 2016 17 academic year. And finally, we want to point out that we continue to provide mental health resources and support to our student athletes. Uh, this area has grown tremendously over the past several years, and currently more than 65% of our student athletes seek these services within our department. Next slide, please. Obviously, when you uh, compete in the Big Ten Conference uh, for all of our sports, with the exception of women's hockey, which uh, participates in the WCHA, uh, success and winning is a big part of our program. And we're very proud of what our teams and student athletes are accomplishing each year. This past year, we finished 31st in the Directors' Cup out of 305 Division I universities. That places us in the top 11% in college athletics. We won one regular season conference championship in men's hockey and one tournament title in women's hockey. 
Men's hockey advanced to the Frozen Four and played in the national championship game. And women's hockey advanced to the Frozen Four in Duluth. We had seven individuals win Big Ten titles. Max McHugh, Maya Hooten, Shelby Frank, Amir Young, Costa Saltos, Matthew Wilkinson, and Keon Benjamin. Uh, we're very proud of what those student athletes did with their Big Ten championships. And we crowned one individual and state champion, Max McHugh, who's pitched on the top right in the 100 breaststroke. It was his fourth career NCAA title. So again, athletically, we are having great, great success. Next slide, please. I wanted to single out football because as each of you understand, football is a significant revenue driver for our athletics program and very, very visible. And that revenue is used to support all of our programs when I mentioned 22 programs. And I think sometimes this get lost because it's not very Minnesotan to talk about these great accomplishments, but I wanted to make sure we recognize our student athletes and Coach Fleck in our program. We went nine and four last season. We reached nine wins in a season for the 11th time in school history and for the third time in six years under head coach P.J. Fleck. We reached nine wins or more for the third time in a four-year span, something that has not been done since 1902-1905. I'll say that again. It has not been done since 1902 to 1905. We beat Wisconsin for the third time in five years and won consecutive games for the first time since 1993-94 against the Badgers. <laughs> we beat Syracuse in the pinstripe bowl and have now won six straight bowl games. It's the longest bowl winning streak in Big Ten history and this is the second longest active streak in the country behind Alabama which is at seven. Our football program is 35 and 15 in our last 50 games, fourth best record in the Big Ten. We've had 14 student athletes drafted in the last four years, which is the most draft picks in a four year span for Minnesota in the modern day seven round NFL draft. We've had nine academic All Americans in the last five years. Minnesota has had 27 football student athletes named academic All Americans since 1956. And nine of those, or 33%, have received that honor in the last five years. So not only are we having great success on the field, we're having great, great success off the field as well. Next slide, please. I wanted to present this slide to you because I have a chance each year. I, I do several speaking engagements. And when the slide, when I was presenting this, just jumped off the page to me. But again, it just shows you the success that we're having. But if you look at the Power 5 teams, and of course the Power 5 teams are teams from the Big Ten, the Big 12, the SEC, the ACC, and the Pac-12. We've had nine-plus wins in the last three full seasons, so take out the year of COVID where several games were uh, canceled. If you look at that list of programs, uh, we're very, very proud that our program is a part of that. But when you talk about Minnesota in the same sense with Ohio State, Michigan, Clemson, Utah, Oregon, Georgia, who's two-time national champion, Alabama, and Notre Dame, you can see the great, great success we're having with our football program. Next slide, please. For this past fiscal year, we want to point out that uh, we clearly understand the expectations of this board and our campus to have a balanced budget, and we achieved that goal. It's important to note that we've made budget reductions totaling $7 million since pre-pandemic, so we've been very strategic with our budget cuts to make sure, again, that we can balance our budget and, and uh, move that in the right direction. In our COVID loan, if you recall, uh, with COVID, when we had no fans at our events for one year, uh, we were able to have our COVID loan paid down to $15.3 million. And I want to thank Myron Franz and Julie Thomason and their staff for working close with us as we continue to pay down that COVID loan. But again, we're very excited that we have a balanced budget for this past fiscal year. Next slide, please. I apologize that this is repetitive for some of our board members, but I know we have four new board members. And I always like to talk about, to make sure each of us understand what our revenue buckets are in our department. Um, and I say this each year, it doesn't matter if uh, we're talking about the University of Minnesota, we're talking about the University of Wisconsin, or we're talking about the University of Southern California, we all have similar revenue buckets. And those revenue buckets fall into five categories. Uh, the first one, of course, is our Big Ten and NCAA distribution. So I talked about our new TV media deal that started July 1st, and then the NCAA distribution comes from March Madness. And as all of you know, I'm on that men's basketball committee. That's why I'm out here in Las Vegas. But that's our first revenue stream bucket. 
Our second revenue stream bucket is our ticket sales. And those are for football, men's basketball, women's basketball, women's hockey, men's hockey, whatever events we sell tickets for, that's a revenue stream for us. Our third revenue bucket is our fundraising. That's the Golden Gopher Fund. And we work very closely with Kathy Schmidlkoffer, uh, Bob Burgett from the University of Minnesota Foundation, and Dusty Clements and his staff do a wonderful job uh, with fundraising. We continue to have record fundraising years each year. But again, fundraising is the next revenue bucket. Our fourth revenue bucket is our sponsorships. And that is our partnership with uh, uh, Gopher Sports Properties, which is a division of Learfield. Uh, we have one of the top agreements in the country where they provide us a guarantee. And then that's where you see all the advertising in our venues. Or when you listen to Gopher Sporting Events on the radio, you hear the advertisements. That's through our multimedia rights department, uh, uh, which is, again, Gopher Sports Properties. And then our fifth revenue bucket uh, is a miscellaneous bucket. And that's our licensing revenue concession revenue, rental revenue. As all of you know, we rent out our facilities to other groups, whether it be the Minnesota State High School Association, who use our events for championships, et cetera. And that's our, our again, our five revenue buckets uh, that drive our revenue for our department. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll turn it over to Tim McClary, who will talk about our FY24 budget. Tim. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, Vice Chairs Kenyanya, Vice Chair uh, Hipsch, and uh, uh, Chair Mayron, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. <clears throat> so as Mark noted, um, I'll discuss more about the components of the FY24 budget. First, to provide a little bit of context, athletics is often referred to as the university's front porch. With that in mind, the budget balances what, ath what athletics is responsible to achieve, which is to represent the university at a high level with competitive success, positive PR, student athlete personal success, NCAA university and Title IX compliance, and a balanced budget. So getting to the first slide and looking, looking first at conference and NCAA distributions, you can clearly see the impact of our membership in the Big Ten as our largest revenue category. The percentage of total revenue remains very similar to prior years. The Big Ten component is almost all tied to media rights for football and to a lesser extent, men's basketball. The NCAA portion of this distribution is almost entirely tied to the NCAA men's basketball tournament that is dispersed to all Division I schools. The next highest category is ticket sales. We continue to see success with football and we have an attractive schedule with some marquee opponents this fall. Additionally, additionally, we are coming off a great men's hockey season with great attendance, and we expect that to continue this year. Consistent with recent history, football comprises 66% of ticket sales and scholarship seating donations. Football, men's basketball, and men's hockey combined account for 95%. Now looking at fundraising, which is comprised of scholarship seating donations, gifts tied to capital project financing, salaries, and key programming such as the student athlete, such as student athlete development and leadership programs. We continue to be very fortunate for our generous donors and for the hard work of our staff involved in fundraising. Due to inflation and other factors in the budget, fundraising is becoming more of a factor in funding our operations along with other newer demands like name image likeness, often referred to as NIL. The next largest individual category is sponsorships and primarily comes from our multimedia rights partner, Gopher Sports Properties, as Mark said. That contract runs through 2027 and we receive an annual guarantee that ranks favorably across the country. Lastly, the other category is comprised of items such as licensing, concessions, parking, endowment earnings and facility rentals. In this category, we are excited to see some growth in concessions and licensing from recently negotiated contracts. Now shifting to our FY24 expense budget. Salaries and benefits is the largest category. Similar to the university as a whole, athletics is a people-driven enterprise with a, with a wide variety of functions that go into supporting our 22 sports and operations that are critical to competitive success, compliance, 
revenue generation, the fan experience, and the student athlete experience. Recruiting and retaining staff are critical. We remain at the bottom half or bottom third of the Big Ten for most coaching positions and at or below the campus midpoint for most support, staffs, for, for most support staff positions. We are thankful for the board's support, investing in coaches, in recent support investing in coaches, and thankful for the passion and sacrifice from all of our staff. Now to operations. This category is primarily, this category primarily includes operating budgets for, support, for sports and support units. For FY24, the operating budget for many of these areas will still be below pre-pandemic FY19 levels. In total, these categories are up around 3% over five years, compared with inflation exceeding 20% during that time. The items growing the most are insurance, mental health services, part-time labor, meals, and travel. Inflation is driving the increase for many of these categories. As noted before, fundraising is currently part of the solution for covering the increase in cost in these areas. Next is scholarships. Scholarships remain critical to the mission and to the benefits provided to student athletes. A recent change and an increase to the budget are payments made for academic achievement. This was as a result of the Supreme Court's decision in the Alston case. Based on financial aid disbursement timelines, timelines FY24 will be the first, first year of the full budget impact at $2.1 million. Similar to previous changes in NCAA legislation, including allowing to pay the full cost of attendance and loosened restrictions on nutrition, providing these new payments is a great benefit to student athletes and it is also critical to provide in, to provide in competing across college athletics, especially with the impact of NIL, name, name, image, and likeness, and the transfer portal. The other, category, other categories include debt, facilities, and the cost pool. In FY24, debt service is down from FY23, which was down from FY22 due to paying off multiple loans. It will go up in future years with the completion of board approved projects that include the ice plant replacements, women's, women's gymnastics facility replacement, COVID loan and video board replacements. In regard to facilities, the budget includes over $4 million in utilities with the second largest components being custodial and maintenance. Inflation is also impacting both of these categories. In summary, for FY24, we have put together a plan for a balanced budget. The categories have ranges and potential outcomes, and there, there will be variables on the revenue and expense side, and we will be proactively monitoring and managing accordingly. Thank you very much. Uh, Athletic Director Coyle, any further remarks on your behalf? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple more slides, Chair Mayron. All right. And I'm happy to take questions. So uh, yep. I see the next slide has, has come up, and, and I'd be remiss again if I didn't recognize uh, Myron Franz and Julie Thompson uh, and Tim McCleary and his staff for a wonderful job they do. Uh, as all of you know, we have a complex operation, and, and I'm just really grateful for their leadership and assistance. And Tim, thank you for, for all that you do in, in your business staff. Uh, I did want to point out that we have three new coaching hires that we made this past year, and they will all, of course, be starting their first year with us as we begin FY24, uh, we hired Keegan Cook, who is our new volleyball coach. He is the eighth full-time head coach, third since 1996. He has more than 15 years of coaching experience, which includes the last eight years at head coach at the University of Washington. At Washington, Cook led the Huskies to four Pac-12 championships and eight trips to the NCAA tournament. Washington advanced to the NCAA Elite Eight four times in the final four once. Uh, Coach Cook posts an overall record of 198 and 56 at Washington and went 107 and 33 in conference play. He coached 12 different student athletes to a combined 18 ABCA All America honors and earned conference and region coach of the year honors. He also coached at the high school club international level with USA Volleyball. Next slide, please. He also hired a new women's basketball coach, uh, Dawn Plitzy White, and she brings 
Uh, she is the 13th full-time head coach of Gopher Women's Basketball. She brings 28 years of coaching experience, 16 as a head coach to Minnesota, and has been the head coach of winning teams at West Virginia, South Dakota, Northern Kentucky, and Grand Valley State. In those years as a head coach, 15 winning seasons, 9 20 win, 20 win seasons, and two 30 win campaigns as head coach of her teams have reached the postseason 15 of her 16 seasons. Teams have competed in the last four NCAA tournaments. Her coaching record is 356 and 141, which is above 70%, and 201 and 66 in league play. Her teams have finished tied for fifth or higher in regular season conference play in all 16 seasons and recorded 11 top three conference finishes. She led both West Virginia and South Dakota to the NCAA tournament, and she participated in postseason play at all four of her head coaching stops. She took South Dakota to the Sweet 16 in 2022 and won the Division II National Championship at Grand Valley State in 2006. She's also coached at two Big Ten schools, Michigan and Wisconsin, and has recruited the state of Minnesota and surrounding areas at previous stops. Next slide, please. Our third new head coach that we hired this year is Lois Arterberry. Uh, Lois is the eighth full-time head coach and brings more than nine years of coaching experience to Golden Gopher program. She was the head coach at St. Thomas for the past two seasons, where she guided the program through its transition from Division Three to Division One. She was at Missouri for two years, serving as a volunteer assistant in the 2019-20 season and as an assistant coach in the 2020-21 season. She was a volunteer assistant at UNC Asheville in 2018-19. Arterberry was the head coach at Eastern Illinois from 2017 to 18. And from 2015 to 17, she served at Jackson State's men's and women's head coach. During her time at Jackson State, Coach Arterberry guided the men's program to back-to-back -back appearances in the NCAA tournament, as well as its first conference title in 18 years. On the women's side, Jackson State made back-to-back -back HBCU championship finals appearances in 2016 and 2017. So we're thrilled to have Lois uh, come over to Minnesota and lead our women's tennis program. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, I go back to the very beginning of our presentation when I talked about the enormous changes taking place in college athletics. And we did want to talk about NIL and Champions for Life. As of July 1st, 2021, student athletes can profit off their name, image, and likeness. Space has progressed uh, at an incredible speed from a working group in the fall of 2020 to an ever-expanding group of staff members who focused heavily on NIL in 2023. We hired Jeremiah Carter as Senior Associate Athletic Director for NIL Policy and Risk Management. He is responsible for identifying and managing issues related to emerging structural changes within college athletics, which include the university's name, image, and likeness activities, adherence to university policies, and governance. We launched a Minnesota NIL marketplace, which enables fans, businesses, and donors and alumni to connect with our student athletes directly. It provides a safe, easy, and efficient way to connect and formulate an NIL agreement with fans and businesses. Dickey Town Athletes launched in August of 2022 with the goal of ensuring NIL opportunities for student athletes. Named the NIL Collective of Gopher Athletics through a partnership with Gopher Sports Properties this past April. And again, it's able to partner with student athletes across multiple sports and help fans and donors connect directly with student athletes to help facilitate NIL opportunities. Some examples are partnerships with Cub, Unilever, DeWalt, and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. And every fan can support Dingytown athletes by signing up for a monthly or annual membership or by making a direct financial donation to Dingytown athletes. Also, in the fall of 2022, Minnesota started providing education-related financial support to our student-athletes. This program was launched this past academic year based on the Austin Supreme Court ruling, which allows an institution to provide additional academic assistance to student-athletes. Based on these changes, Athletics implemented a program called Champions for Life, which provides an opportunity for all student-athletes to receive additional financial academic awards based on completion of educational sessions financial literacy, our additional leadership U program, and remaining in good academic standing. It's important to note that athletics paid out more than $1 million in additional academic awards this past year. So with that, Chair Mayron and President Edinger, we welcome uh, any questions or comments from uh, you other members of the board. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Athletic Director Coyle, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cleary, for your presentation as well. What an outstanding program we have and that you continue to shepherd through. It, it's, um, it's really inspiring. I do have one quick question, and we'll open up uh, to others. Uh, from time to time, and even as recently as a couple days ago, uh, regents get email communications from stakeholders in the community uh, promoting, asking us to reinstate one or more of the three sports that we voted to eliminate a few years ago. And uh, I'm wondering if you could address that, um, Athletic Director Coyle, in terms of efforts that you make to reevaluate uh, the possibility of reinstatement or how you approach those requests that I'm sure you're getting as well. Yeah, uh, Chair Maron, thank you for the question. And and we completely understand that, that you all are gonna hear from student athletes. In fact, this past year, I, I met with members of our cross country team, uh, I think uh, once with the entire team, and then I had a chance to visit with some other student athletes uh, on our track uh, and field program and cross country program about this very topic. And if you go back, when we made that recommendation almost three years ago to the Board of Regents to eliminate uh, men's indoor track and field, uh, men's tennis, and men's gymnastics, we talked about there was three areas that, that we focused on when we made that difficult recommendation to the board that the board ultimately approved. Uh, the first one is we talked about the financial impact. And if you recall, uh, we are in the midst of COVID. Uh, we are looking at uh, the potential downfall of revenue around $75 million. And I also pointed out that again, our budget ranks in the bottom half of the Big Ten, yet we offered the fourth highest number of sports in the Big Ten. And for example, our peers at Wisconsin, they have an operating budget uh, that is $30 million more than our budget, yet we had the same amount of sports that we sponsored. So when, when the board approved that recommendation <laughs> to eliminate those three sports, now with 22 sports, I believe we rank eighth or ninth in the Big Ten with the number of teams that we, that we sponsored the program. So it puts us in alignment on that side. The second area that we focused on was Title IX. Um, and I think there's confusion around Title IX. We did not have to cut these sports because of Title IX. Uh, as you know, the undergraduate population in Minnesota with male to female students changes. And uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but I think it was 52 to 48 percent female to male. And for us to remain in compliance with Title IX, we had to look at either eliminating men's sports and opportunities for male student athletes or we could have added female sports. But when you look at the opportunity to add women's sports, given our financial situation and the pressure that we were all feeling uh, during COVID, and we did research and for us to add women's sports, uh, we felt like we'd have to add two to potentially three sports. And each one of those sports would cost three to $5 million more annually on our department. So again, there's a financial component that ties in with that as well. So again, the, the first component was the financial component the second one was Title IX. And then the third area, um, as the athletic director, I had to make a tough recommendation. And I felt in the best interest of our program for us to continue to move forward, to be competitive in the Big Ten, uh, to be competitive nationally, that uh, a program with 22 sports, looking at what our peers do in the Big Ten, we felt like that was the best way where we could service all of our student athletes in all of our programs, and we could make sure that all of our student athletes were having meaningful participation opportunities when they competed for us. So again, I, I, I still have conversations with those students. Um, I have, um, uh, we wanna make sure that we have open dialogue. I understand people are frustrated with that, uh, that recommendation and, and what was approved by the board, uh, but we will continue to evaluate that as we move forward. Uh, we continue to have great success with our track program. Our men's track program was actually ranked number one in the country uh, at the start of the season. We had great success uh, with our track program. So we'll continue to monitor that as we move forward. Thank you. Other questions, uh, Regent Hitch. Uh, thanks, Chair Maron, and thanks, uh, thanks, Athletic Director Mark uh, Coyle and uh, Chief Financial Officer uh, Tim McCleary. Uh, great presentation, and I think that uh, my, mine isn't really a question; it's more of a comment, and it's for our whole board. You know, last month we heard from the foundation, and they had great success again. They raised 4.5 billion during the last campaign, and 400 million in the last year. And we just heard from our alumni association that they raised 208 million from alumni in the state. And uh, so, when you look at that front porch, how important that is to fundraising uh, for our foundation and for the whole mission of the U. 
that what you guys are doing with a uh, low amount of budget is really amazing. And as a board, we really have to watch out. I don't, I'm not proud that we're in the lowest third of the Big Ten in salaries. I don't think that's sustainable to stay there and still have the kind of success we want to have as a state. So we just have to really watch that uh, to make sure that we're pushing that and uh, we're pushing that budget so we, we keep pe paying people competitively so we can win on the field. So anyways, thanks for all you do, and I'm really proud about the academics and, the, and, um, and just the, in general, the whole program, the whole athletic department seems like it's really doing good things. You hear reports in the paper about other programs, and you think, wow, I'm glad that's not us. And uh, so thank you for all you do to keep us on the straight and narrow as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Colley. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, uh, Chief Financial Officer McCleary and uh, Athletic Director Coyle um, for being here and for your great presentation. Um, uh, I did have a good conversation with the um, folks who were advocating for the men's indoor track. Um, and some of the things that they told me were a little bit surprising to me, uh, and I wondered if you could address them. Um, specifically, they mentioned that when they learned that the program was being canceled, they were able to get commitments for the entire cost of the program um, from alumni. Um, and so that seems to um, mitigate some of the financial concerns. And then the other thing that they mentioned was that uh, that the track and field teams operate year round and effectively operate as one single team with men and women and that the effect of canceling men's indoor track is that they basically sort of leave half the team behind for a third of the year. Um, but also that a lot of the students are going and participating in these indoor track um, track meets anyway on their own dimes and having to pay for themselves and they're considered I think it's called unattached from the university, so it doesn't um, go on their record, but they're essentially taking themselves to these tournaments anyway, or to these meets as, as often as they can anyway. I just, this the, that seemed sort of surprising to me that the effect was essentially leaving half of the team behind for a third of the year when they, uh, when, you know, from their perspective as athletes, they're, they're operating as a full year round team in, in all of the different events. And I realize there's some people who are on one team, one type of sport or another, but could you address that? Athletic Director Coyle. Yes, uh, Chair Mayron and, and Regent Gulley, thank you for the question. And, and, um, and, and I want to be respectful in my answer in that um, the fundraising component of it, we, we, uh, we would welcome those conversations. Uh, we, we are not aware. We, uh, had worked with groups that if they did have individuals who were interested in supporting those programs uh, to work with uh, Dusty Clemens and our Golden Gopher Fund and the University of Minnesota Foundation. And I'm not aware of any gifts that have come in uh, for that purpose. Uh, if you recall, and this was prior to you coming on the board, uh, Regent Goldie, we, uh, we built a new track uh, by our athletic facilities on campus. And, and my numbers may be off slightly, but I believe that facility was 16 to $18 million dollars and uh, and our uh, and working and fundraising that event, I think we raised less than a million dollars from our track and field community uh, for that project. So uh, that went into our thought process when we made the difficult recommendation to eliminate the men's indoor uh, track and field program. You are correct that we do have several student athletes who compete as unattached uh, in the indoor season. And uh, and again, we work with our student athletes to provide opportunities for them to compete unattached. Uh, and, and make sure they have that opportunity and we support them any way we can. Uh, Jeremiah Carter, who uh, works in our compliance, and now Kevin Goldman, we work with them to make sure it does not impact uh, their eligibility on that side. But again, we work closely with them on that side as well. So uh, again, uh, we, we meet with those student athletes. I've met with them. Uh, we wanna continue to work with them to provide them with a first class experience. Uh, but again, when we made that recommendation uh, three years ago, we thought it was best for our department as we move forward. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Regent Wheeler. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair Mayron, and thank you, Athletic Director Coyle, and really uh, Associate Athletic, 
Athletic Director McCleary. Um, really appreciate, as was mentioned before, the combination of success on the field and in the classroom, and that's uh, really remarkable. Um, and I also appreciate you addressing uh, the elimination of the sports, which is clearly on everybody's uh, uh, mind and has been a pain point for many. So thank you for that. What my question is uh, really regarding, you know, this the world has turned completely with the transfer portal and with the name, image, and likeness work. And I'm hearing um, from other schools just exorbitant funds being paid to attract athletes and things like that to their program. And I'm wondering if there's any guardrails being set at all by the NCAA or anything that's helpful to you. If so, um, you know, what? And uh, if not, why not? is my question. Athletic Director Coyle. Uh, Chair Mayoron and, and Regent Wheeler, thank you for the question. Um, you, you know, uh, I would I'd be remiss. Uh, I don't know how many Doug Petersons there are, but thank God he's at the University of Minnesota uh, <laughs> because um, we have worked very closely with the Office of General Counsel. Uh, Jeremiah Carter, there's a lot of credit. Uh, Julie Manning, who's in the room, our Deputy Athletic Director. Um, you've heard me say many times that doing it right in Minnesota matters. Uh, that is something we talk about every day in our department, that doing it right matters. And I can tell you that name, image, and likeness, the transfer portal, it has been an absolute sprint. But at Minnesota, I think we've taken a very cautious approach, and I think we're going to win the long run. Uh, and what I mean by that is working with Doug Peterson and OGC, Jeremiah Carter and others, uh, we have been very intentional with the, with the fundraising that Dignitown Athletes is doing. We've been very intentional with our student athletes. Uh, there are peers across the country who, uh, with names and likeness, you have student athletes who are getting paid six figures to go to that school to compete. Uh, I'm very grateful for our coaches uh, who understand how we're going to do it at Minnesota. There are not many guardrails in place nationally right now. Uh, the new NCAA president, Charlie Baker, who I've had a chance to visit with and spend time with him, is trying to get a national solution. I don't know if that will happen. Uh, so, again, we continue to work closely with Doug Peterson, Office of General Counsel, to make sure that when we recruit a young woman or a young man to come to Minnesota, they have NIL opportunities, but we're going to do it the right way. It's going to be realistic. We're not going to make false promises. And most importantly, we're not going to do anything that embarrasses this institution, this state, and this community. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for the response. And I'll just uh, I'll just say I appreciate the integrity with which which we are approaching this. And uh, uh, that's not uh, uniform across the country from what I understand. So so thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, last question will come from Regent Farnsworth and that will conclude this presentation. Thank you, Chair. Really brief comment and similar to my colleague to the right here. I'm not feeling very good with my words today, um, so I'll get through this um, quick. But um, kind of wanted to pick up on something that Regent Hipsch was saying. Um, wanted to, of course, thank Athletic Director Coyle, um, Associate, Associate Athletic Director McCleary and, and staff for all of your work um, as a member of the board over um, a little bit over the last, a little bit past two years um, since being elected, um, I've spent a lot of time engaging with our athletics portfolio. And I don't view it just um, as attending events or going to games. I view it as actually interacting um, with our student athletes and our intercollegiate athletics portfolio and supporting that um, from a board level. So kind of to what Regent Hips was saying, you know, um, understanding the importance of our intercollegiate athletics work and how that relates to development and um, making um, great contributions to the academic portfolio of the university via the strong student athletes we have. And it's about so much more than just uh, the incredible athletic work that's happening on the fields. Um, thinking about how the sport can continue to support that um, as much as possible. And uh, the other thing I'll just mention is, you know, appreciate the conversation that um, has been brought up in a little bit of the discussion back and forth around the sports eliminations. It's definitely a hard and, and painful issue for many. I'm understanding, you know, that the majority of this board as seated now did not deal with that issue um, as a governance issue. And so um, I think that adds a dynamic to it as well. But, you know, continue to hear about that often. Um, I think it was appropriate that it was addressed today. And, and so thanks, Chair Mayron, for bringing that up and having um, some of the dialogue there. Uh, and I think that's it. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Athletic Director Coyle and our CFO McCleary. Tim McCleary, thank you for your presentation and everything you've brought to us. Thank you. All right. Uh,
There are no reports of the committees because committees did not meet this month. So we have no committee business as indicated on item 11 of our agenda. That brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, that concludes our business today. This meeting of the Board of Regents is now adjourned.